gentlemen, and welcome to episode 96 of McRae Live. The date today is Thursday, August the 27th, 2020. The exact time is 11.13 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm coming to you live from the Voice Band Studios in Toronto, Canada. And today I have two very special guests on the program today that I'm very excited about. I'm very excited to talk to these two gents uh, about our top five horror movie intros. Opening scenes, I think we should say. Not just intros, but opening scenes. This is going to be a good one, so you may want to stick around. And my guests, uh, let me just read a little bit of their their bio. Uh, the guests are today on the program, I have uh, Paul Davis and Brett Nitchen. And Paul is a filmmaker who has helmed two feature films for Blumhouse's Into the Dark series on Hulu. In addition, he directed the acclaimed documentary, Beware the Moon, the inside story of an American werewolf in London. As an actor, Paul played a Wookiee in Solo, a Star Wars story. And I think I know which one it was. No, I have no idea which one it was, but I'll get him to tell me. Uh, Brett is a writer for both screen and audio with projects in development at Amblin TV, BBC, Audible, and Film Nation. Brett and Paul are collaborating on new projects together, all in the horror genre. And they join me today to discuss our top five horror openings, intros, whatever. Brett, Paul, welcome to the program. How you guys doing? Hey, hey. <laughs> great. So it's great to have you. Now, Paul is on the left of your screen and Brett is on the right of your screen. I, I should have had little names up there. I actually, actually, you know what? I think the Zoom call, we can kind of see your names there a little bit. Uh, right. Brett is in the gray T-shirt and Paul is in the black T-shirt. So just uh, in case you guys were wondering uh, who was who and you don't need to know who I am. Uh, Paul will distinguish himself with his accent in a matter of seconds and everyone will know who he is. <laughs> That's true. That's true. What do you mean? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. As a Canadian, of course, you know, I had to, um, you know, there's the stereotype of, you know, oot and a boot. It really isn't oot and a boot. That's a large exaggeration. But there, there are certain parts of Canada where uh, the about is more about like A B O A T, and uh, I was guilty of it a couple of times when I was. I've never really said it on a consistent basis, but when you get lazy or just kind of casually talking, it can come out. And um, but as a voice actor, I've naturally had to sort of curve that because I do a lot of work for uh, the states, and uh, so now I think I just naturally just say you know out about house. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't really. It, it's not really in me anymore. I think I've lost it. So uh, anyway, funny stuff. Um, so Brett. Uh, tell us how, because you tell it great. I love it. So well, I'm, I'm the connector. I'm the, the Gladwell character who connected the two of you. This would not be happening were it not for my social skills. So yeah, <laughs> that's right. I'll, that's I'll right. Exactly. Um, exactly. Well, so yeah, how I met Dave, and then I'll let Paul uh, connect us. We'll be very brief because no one wants to hear this. They want to get to the top five scenes. So <laughs> I met Dave because I have a scripted podcast with the BBC that's coming out in December. And um, there was a role that I thought, Dave, I'm a big fan of Dave's show and the whole community, that he's the community that he has created. And there was a specific role that I knew Dave would be great for because I know his voice acting experience. And I told the BBC, reach out to this guy. He's got this big horror channel, he's fantastic. So they did, they thought he was great. And then him and I, we've developed a quarantine friendship via, <laughs> via Zoom. And then um, I thought it would be great if, uh, if Dave was introduced to Paul, because Paul has made a bunch of movies for Blumhouse and is very tied into the, the horror community at large. And I thought he could really add something. And so I suggested that he come on and, and join me. Now, That's Paul, how it happened. I'll let you, there we go. I'll let you take it from there how we met quickly and then we can. We met, I guess it was, was it December 2018? Uh, I was sent. Um, a spec script that Brett had written called Swipe Right. And my agent at CIA thought that I would uh, gravitate towards um, this particular script, which I read it and immediately fell in love with. And I kind of wrote a love letter to, to, to Brett and the producer saying that um, I wanted to make it. Um, and then I didn't hear anything for a while, but then I got an email out of the blue from Brett, who would obviously read the, the email that I sent back and um, 
it was it was strange. I don't want to say it was my first fan letter, but that's what it felt like, <laughs> you know, uh, in, a, in a very very strange way. But I just I I felt good that you know obviously what Brett had intended the script to be is what I took from it, and you know which you know dozens and dozens of people read your scripts in this town, and you know everybody will have a different interpretation. Right, but I just seem to be that one guy who just didn't have any notes, or yep, this is this is this is the script. It needs to be made exactly how this is. Don't change a thing. And of course, I went into the meeting for it, and they wanted to change everything. And I was just like, "See you later." So, <laughs> um, but we actually met in person. Uh, Brett was in town uh, meeting with agents and managers you when say I was having in L.A. Just to start in L.A. Out. Yeah, sorry. You're Sorry, in London, I'm being that New York, good. Dave's in Canada. It's yeah, a none of us yet. are in LA. <laughs> I keep yeah. saying in town, none of us are in LA. Um, we were having the premiere, the cast and crew screening of my second Into the Dark movie, Uncanny Annie. And I knew Brett was in town, so I said, come along. And I remember I was, I went in, I did my little intro. I had a glass of wine in my hand, so it was going to be one of those nights. It's very posh. Um, <laughs> and then I just went and found the first seat that I could. And I ended up sitting next to Brett during the entire movie and none of us knew. Well, Brett obviously no, I, knew, I just introduced no, I the movie. Knew. I knew because Paul's agent said, heads up, he's six foot nine, which is crazy go. because in Hollywood, <laughs> everyone is five, seven. Like I'm the tallest person usually. And so six, nine is crazy. And uh, I was nervous to meet Paul. Um, and I was drinking a lot of water. Like now, anytime I get nervous, I chug water. And so then he sits next to me and I had to pee right when his movie started. So I had to lean over and I was like, dude, like, do not be offended. I'm going to walk out five minutes into this. It has nothing to do with you. I need to use the bathroom. This is a nightmare. And he was like, <laughs> fine, dude. it's fine. And, uh, but no, it was, it was a pack screening. It was a great, it was a great film. And actually, I know that your, your, your community, Dave, is, is, is I don't want to say fanatical, obsessed, but both are true. No, that's about right. But about Halloween and mm -hmm. um, in Paul's movie, Uncanny Annie, that I saw that night, the the young man who played, I always forget his name. I'm sorry. What is what is the uh, actor? D Dylan Arnold. Yes. Who played. Um, he was Cameron. Laurie Strode's granddaughter's boyfriend, the douchey boyfriend in Halloween mm -hmm. 2018. Uh, oh, Cameron, who, who played yeah, Cameron. Yes. Right. Yeah, he was great fun. He was great, great fun. And of course, that night was also sitting next to Christina Klee from Rob Zombie's Halloween. Of course. Of course. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. Of course. So, well, yeah, Paul was, has a lot of tentacles in the Halloween. It was Halloween, all Halloween. So, Everything yeah. was Halloween that night. <laughs> you know, that, that's why I wanted him to come on, because he's going to be your one of your inroads into the Halloween universe. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's cool. It's it, Look, I mean, I've, I've learned so much. You know, there's a saying... And you guys know this. I'm not saying anything that, you know, you guys don't know. But and it sounds like an overused cliche, but it's true. I mean, a lot of this business and a lot of any business, but especially the entertainment business, because that's what it is. It's a business uh, is connections and who, you know, and and nurturing those connections and fostering those relationships. I mean, obviously, you have to have a certain level of talent, you know, I mean, um, if you have no talent, it does well, I mean, there are some people that get somewhere without any talent, that but you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's true. I mean, uh, I mean, it, it's sort of like, I remember uh, how I developed a relationship with the Yablons and and I was at the uh, 40th anniversary convention for Halloween in Pasadena and I walked up to Irwin's table, of course, the uh, the creator of Halloween. I mean, everybody, you know, says, that, oh, it's, you know, John Carpenter, John Carpenter. He was very, very important, but we sometimes forget that it was Irwin's idea from the very beginning and obviously, you know. Um, anyway, he was there promoting his book and I talked to him and we were just shooting the shit and there just happened to be a moment of about 10 minutes where nobody else was coming up to him and we were talking and through that conversation he found out that I was a voice actor and he told me that his granddaughter is obsessed with voiceover and could I speak to her about it and I said absolutely of course I'd like to and then that led to me meeting his son Mickey who of course plays Richie in the original Halloween and and uh, they came to the voice arts awards at um, Warner Brothers, I treated them to that. And then the next thing you know, I'm having dinner with them and I'm holding an original reel-to-reel -reel recording of the Halloween theme in my hand. 
And uh, so it, it's wild, you know, to think that, you know, where certain things go, you know, and, and uh, uh, it's so important to, to, you know, be kind, be honest, be transparent. And, uh, you know, I mean, I know it sounds like it sounds like a complete <laughs> dichotomy to the entertainment industry, you know, to some degree. But but I, I you know, I, I, I firmly believe in that. You know, and and uh -huh. uh, one of the things that I, I loved about Brett, of course, is that, you know, as soon like we clicked right away. As soon as we talked, you it I you know, you can feel it. You know, you can feel people, you know, and and um and Paul, I mean, you know, we just met today, but you know, I can feel you. Yeah, you know, I can you know, I can feel it. And that's and it's all the way from Toronto, man. All the way from Toronto. <laughs> you're you're damn right. You're damn yeah, absolutely. And uh so no, I hear you. I mean it's a it's a really interesting it's funny sometimes, you know, you end up talking to people or meeting people who you, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it sometimes happens in the most unexpected ways. And that's why I think it's so mm -hmm. important to never get locked into a certain idea or a certain way that something has to happen, you know, but. Yeah, uh, and it's rare. It's yeah. rare. Yes, it people is. like that in this industry. I think that's, that's kind of like the, the big deal behind yeah. it because, you know, I've been at countless occasions where you're talking to someone and they're constantly, well, it's harder for me for them to look over my shoulder because they have to kind of like peer out right? like a Dilophosaurus. But it's, you know, they're constantly scanning the room to look for someone more important than you. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've, I've, you know, I've been through that a lot. And, you know, so when you do meet someone, like I had the same connection with Brett as well, you know, yeah. and, you know, you just, you just know in that moment of engagement you know, yeah. that someone is genuinely interested in what you have to say 100%. and, you know, and you reciprocate in that, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very rare in this business, you know? Yeah. So that's why, you know, Brett and I are, are working together. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, um, I agree with everything you've said. Um, so yeah. So now that the powwow is, uh, sort of out of the way, uh, let's, uh, let's dive into this. So this is something, this was Brett's idea. I think it was your idea, Brett, right? Yeah. Yeah. I suggested a few different topics that I thought your, uh, community would like community. I keep on saying community. It feels weird. Community cult. <laughs> <laughs> the family? I don't know. It sounds very strange. Well, it doesn't know, I mean, like we're going to pull out weapons and plan some sort people of. People do thing. send me images of of me, you know, in flowery things. No, no, no. They do. All right. Well, the, the, McCra the McCray family. Well, right. The, the, the McCrazies is what they're called. McCrazies. The McCrazies. McCrazies. Okay. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, so, yeah. So, yes, you had suggested. I thought it was a really good idea. I like doing top fives because as I was saying to Paul before you um, jumped on, Brett, is that I've done a couple of top fives on my channel before and some are easy because sometimes uh, the, you know, the pool to draw from isn't as deep and sometimes it's easy to get, you know, a top five of things. And sometimes it's really hard because somebody's filmography or the, the pool is right. very, very deep. But top fives are always fun to do because you know, it really challenges you to to really sort of decipher what what could be a top five here. Like what rather than just sort of go the traditional route and pick, you know, the staples, which I have a feeling I've done a little bit here because I was really I was like, oh, but I like oh, but I like I was really having a hard time with this, probably harder than any, than any of the other top fives I've done. Um and, you know, we're going to approach this. Like, I think there's a couple of variables for which we could approach this as. Obviously, it's our top five. This isn't this isn't the Bible, folks. It's, it's you know, it's our top five opening, favorite opening scenes in horror. So whether that means it's scary or just really interesting or eerie or cool or, you know, whatever. Uh, take your pick. It's our top five sort of favorite um, uh, openings in horror. And, but there's many different ways that you can sort of... Uh, you know, measure that. So, uh, we'll, you know, we'll discuss as we go. We'll bounce back and forth and uh, we'll just have some fun and see if we share some of the same ideas. And then, of course, you in the chat room can share your ideas and see if you guys have anything. And then if you're watching after the fact, you can, of course, comment below and let us know. Um, so who wants to go first? One one interjection before, yes. we, before we start. So <laughs> the question should be asked, what constitutes an opening scene? Well, is it... Is it the title drop? Is it the first location, the first sequence, the first few minutes? It's kind of arbitrary, however you draw the lines, because certain movies don't have a title drop. Certain movies don't change location. 
Um, so I think that it's one of these things where intuitively we're all agreeing that it's the first few minutes of a movie. It's like the first breath, right? right. Because I, I think any way, any other way that we draw it is kind of arbitrary. So right. um, even even though we haven't defined it in such a specific way, we we know what we're we're talking about. And if people in the chat have a a different idea, I'm interested to hear uh, how people would define it. But for our purposes, that's right. how we're approaching it. That's first a, few minutes of the film. Excellent point. I I was I remember when I did the the most iconic houses in horror, and you know. When I began that list, I think people just automatically assumed I was going to say the Myers house because, you know, it's a Halloween family here and I like Halloween's my favorite horror movie of all time. Um, but I really like to approach things like you said, like we, there has to be a measuring stick, like there has to be a litmus test. And there's many different ways that you can approach that. Um, and I came at that video with the bar was, well, what would be the most recognized, like in terms of iconic what would be the most recognizable to the average person? So you can take that house, show most everybody or show anybody, and most of those people would be able to identify what it is. Right. And the Myers house is not high on that list. <laughs> you know, I think most people wouldn't know what that is to the average person because it's only in one movie. I know it's in Halloween 2 a little bit, but it's only in one movie and then it changes all the time. Uh, I think the most iconic if you will in in my in my list was the psycho house i think i think that's the house that you could probably oh, yeah. show most people and most people would say oh psycho 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 maybe followed by the amityville house or the elm street house or something like that uh but myers was you know like four or five i mean it wasn't it wasn't high you know um so i think the point i'm making is to your point it's always important when you come to these kind of things to have sort of that test like what's the mark for which we're measuring because that's because mm -hmm. that way then you come at it a little more objectively uh than you would from just what's your favorite you know what i mean right, right, so right. yeah no i think that's since, that's since we are in three countries canada the us and england i think that we should have the chat you know we didn't get to have the Olympics this summer because of COVID and this is a shitty substitute, but you know, this is the best we've got. So let the chat well, decide Canada, on the best list. Canada never does well at the summer Olympics. So uh, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, Paul, I think Paul should start just because of his accent, his, his height. Yes. Like his prestige, like his, his posture. Okay. But if you do, do you have like a glass of wine you can hold while you're doing this or no? No, I have like, a shot's worth of water left. Uh, it, so. And we're going to which I'm saving. Five, down, five down to one. Five right? down to one. Yeah. Our... Right. Okay, go ahead. All right. Okay, so am I just doing all of them or are we doing one at a time? Uh, no, no, no. Five, yeah. Five, five, five. We go in a circle. Yeah, right? that's right. That's cool. Okay. That's right. Okay, well, um, I'm going to start with... Um... Okay, how many, how many of you guys have movies pre-1960? Um, Nami. Okay. I don't have any. Well, then maybe it makes sense that this goes first. See, here's the thing. Uh -oh. I don't have any pre-1960. And I was, th this was part of my problem is that I was looking at that. You know right. what I mean? So I was kind of like, oh, I, you know, but no, I, I don't. Well, this one kind of comes in because I saw it at the right age. I think I was seven years old. Um, and I was introduced to a lot of um, uh, movies from the 50s, 40s and 30s. Uh, because my great uncle was a cinephile. He loved movies. And I could only really get into those movies if he would sit there and tell me stories about the actors and the director and, and whatnot. And I saw this little movie called Them mm. from 1954, directed by Gordon Douglas, who went on to do the, uh, the Frank Sinatra detective movies of the, uh, of the 1960s, like Lady and Cement, Tony Rome, and those kind of movies. Mm. Um, and it's one of the, it was actually one of the first. Um, Cold War paranoia monster movies of the 50s. You know, I think you had like the Beast of 20,000 Fathoms before that. And then the trend really kicked off with them. And you had Tarantula and the Blob, Giant Leeches, the monster that challenged the world. And of course, Attack of the 50 Foot Woman. Um, and what I love about this movie is, well, specifically the opening sequence, is it does what any good opening sequence should do. And that set the tone That's of right. a film. You know, and what was remarkable about them is that, you know, it's it's not pre-code, but it's it, it introduced.
produces a character in um, in such a way that was kind of frowned upon after Frankenstein's monster threw a little girl <laughs> in uh, in a pond in the 1931 Frankenstein. Um, you know, from from that because of the outrage that Universal got, you know, children had to be like a beacon of innocence and nothing more. Right. And yet, in them, we we have a, you know this New Mexico terrain, and we're following a, a search airplane and a, and a squad car with two cops in it. And the first thing you see is a little girl holding a doll with an obliterated head. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, hey, for 1954, that's that's stretching it. And even, but even now it's, you know, it's, that's, that's an image. Um, and, you know, obviously you should say there's going to be spoilers, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, right. um, you know, if you haven't so seen the cops it by find, now. <laughs> exactly. It came out in 54 people. Right. Um, they find this girl and she's very much, I remember, I remember when I watched it recently, she's very, she's, she's new from aliens. She is the template for new, you know, doesn't speak disheveled right. carrying the, the doll or in newt's case just the, the head but in yeah. this case the head is completely obliterated um and they take her in and they find this um uh, trailer in which is apparently where she came from and it's completely obliterated <laughs> and they they find like a gun that's been fired and there's a bloody rag and then sugar cubes as you would in a you know in that kind of scenario right and then they take her into custody and they come past a general store and in the general store, they, uh, again, like the trailer, giant hole in the side of it. Um, they find a body in, a, in an underground storage. And then sugar with a tiny little colony of ants on it. Now, if you're a kid in 1954, you know that you've come in to see a movie about giant ants. you know. Right. But it's the way in which these characters have just been completely oblivious. I can imagine kids screaming at the, right. at the screen. It's them, them, they did it. It's them, it's them. Right. Which then leads to the ultimate payoff. I mean, it's the, the opening sequence ends, ends with one of the cops kind of coming back to the general store, hearing this noise, which has already been set up as a threat. And then as soon as he walks off camera, you hear gunshots and you hear him scream, mm. you know, yeah. which is great. You know, right. great. You know, you know that what you're, you're set up for for the rest of the movie. Well, but the payoff to the opening scene is about 20 minutes in where this young girl is finally being questioned by the doctors and the cops about what happened. And it looks like they're like waving a shot of Sambuca in front of her nose. It looks really, <laughs> <laughs> I'd just drink it. If that was me, you know, that's the one way to wake me up. Yeah, that's true. Um, and she just looks dead into camera and just starts screaming them, 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 which is exactly what those kids in the fifties would have been shouting at the cops. Right. So, you know, it's kind of putting your audience in that scenario. And saying to your audience, because these monster monster movies, they were target, they were marketed kids. I don't care what anybody says. Of course, you know, um, yeah, and teenagers, you know, going to drive-ins and whatever. Right. But it it put the audience in that place, which is something that horror movies didn't really do back right. then, because they were always like in a Transylvanian netherworld. You know, it was it was always a way that this was kind of an invasion which is what all of those movies are about. It was about an alien invasion or a foreign invasion. Um, and that opening sequence has just always stuck with me. You know, it's, it's one thing for, um, you know, because again, it was pre The Bad Seed, Mervyn Leroy's The Bad Seed, which came out in 56, which made the child the killer, you know, which right. is completely unheard of. But, you know, for a, for a child to be graphically be shown uh, as a victim of some kind of trauma, to the point that they're in a catatonic state. Yes. You know, that's that's quite an image for a child to see. I, and certainly. If it hit me at seven, it's, yeah, in the 50s, if it hit me at seven years old in the 80s, yes. I can't even begin to imagine what it did in the 50s. That's right. Um, but yeah, it just topped off with that moment where you just start screaming into camera, you know, that loss of control and no one is safe, you know, even children. I've got to see this. That now. for me was, yeah, that for me was, uh, was a pretty, was a pretty big deal. So that's my number five, them. Nice. Interesting. Okay. Brett, take it I away. I've never heard of that film. Um, okay. So my number five to stir up some, some, uh, conflict in the chat room. <laughs> I'm sure he goes. My number Halloween five. Halloween five. <laughs> almost Halloween 
2018. So I would make the argument that Halloween 2018 has the best uh, opening sequence of any film in the Halloween universe. Do you remember <laughs> what it was like? All right, I'm gonna... <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think, you know, I, I, you know, more. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'll justify it. I'll justify it. And I'll let that, I'll, but that's I'll, what it's I'll, all about. He's going to justify it. Okay. Yeah. That's so it. you re you remember when the trailer for Halloween 2018 came out, the anticipation that we all had, every yes. every nerd who wanted to see this movie was waiting for the trailer. Correct. And I have not asked you this question previously. This is, and maybe you'll an answer a way I'm not expecting, but what do you remember most about the trailer? The first time you saw it, what stuck out in your head most about it? Uh, me? Yeah. Uh, the thing that I remember the most about it was I was disappointed by uh, the reveal. I understood, you know, I understood why it's great for a trailer, but I was disappointed that we saw Michael in the closet at the very end. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're Not what you're expecting. I was going to say. <laughs> so for me, what I remembered most about that trailer was the chessboard, the red and white chessboard checkerboard in the in in the uh, yep. hospital in Samsung. I remember that, that too. A lot of symbolism there. That was such uh, an evocative and striking image that after I saw the trailer, that was all I could think about was that was that checker. I don't know whether to call it a chessboard or or a checkerboard, but it was so striking. It was so interesting. And when you think about it, when they re when they did this reboot, the pressure on the filmmakers to nail the opening scene is enormous because everyone's going to judge it based on the first five minutes. Everyone's in the theater. They're ready to see something incredible. Right. And I just thought that that opening sequence, the, the location, the way it was done with Michael Myers standing on the board, like it, it's very uh, emblematic of the entire series. It's the shape waiting to make his move. And the podcasters, who I thought were two of the most interesting characters, I kind of wish they weren't. They're killed his pawns. Off. Yeah, they're pawns. And when he takes out the mask, it's like he wants him to move. It was almost like watching two great chess masters looking each other in the eye and sort of daring someone to move. And you see Michael Myers' shoulder sort of shiver a little bit, like he wants to look, but he's not mm -hmm. going to. He's so patient. And I thought, and then when he starts screaming, say something, say it right into the into the music and the title drop. I was just like, they nailed this. I thought it was the best scene of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, I liked the film, but the opening I thought was incredible. So because of the pressure. And because they needed to really thread that needle, I do think it is the, the most effective and kinetic opening. I know that most people would say part one, um, but maybe it's because I've seen it too many times. It just, I'm more excited to watch the opening of 2018 than any other film in the franchise. And because of all the pressure and because of the, the imagery, I, I think that it needs to be acknowledged as a, as a very successful. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, I will say that, I mean, I, I remember I, I was fortunate enough to see it at the world premiere here in, in Toronto at TIFF. And um, I remember, I, I don't hate the opening. Um, there's certain creative decisions that were made that I wouldn't have done. Um, might be the Halloween purist in me. Um, but I certainly like what I, I do like the idea of of the chessboard and I understand the layers that are there and the symbolism um and um uh I liked the, even the lead up to, I mean there was so much anticipation you know as a fan you're 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 there and it's like you are you know Aaron and whatever her name is and 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 you're kind of going to see Mike I mean we haven't seen this guy in so long and it's not a direct sequel to the Rob Zombie films it's a direct sequel to the to the original so it's been right you know from a certain point of view it's been 40 years since we've seen this Michael and so yeah there's been I, I I get it you know I get what you're saying I I it doesn't affect me the same way as it affected you um but certainly you've intellectualized it well you've you've communicated it well and I certainly can see what you're saying you know for sure 100 percent yeah um well, what's your take on the opening of 2018 really quick yay or nay as a um I, I agree with you that I thought that it was the best scene of the movie mm. Um, I, I had a pro I had problems with, uh, Halloween 2018, uh, just from a fan perspective, I kind of felt like it did the four, it did what the force awakenings did. It just mimicked the beats of the first movie and then kind of disintegrated into a remake of Halloween four. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So, no, it's but it. that's just me. That's just me. I'm looking forward to Halloween Kills, though. I think I am, um, David Gordon Green is a, is a great filmmaker. I think he is. And I think now that, um, you know, I've often said on my show that there were, you know, I had expectations, but they weren't 40 year old fanboy expectations. They, 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 they weren't unrealistic mm-hmm. expectations. There were expectations that I think were sort of, there were certain continuity, uh, character continuity as you know, in regards to the shape that, that I expected to see, because you're telling me that this is the same guy. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, and there, it was, you know, it, I think it was what they did well, they did very well. And what they didn't do well, they, they didn't do well. And the, and it made it stand out more because what they did do well, certain moments, you're like, well, that's really good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, you're onto something there, you know, and it makes sort of the negatives kind of, uh, stand out a bit more for me. I think it's a very good modern slasher movie, but I don't think it's a very good Halloween movie. And I I'm a that's... huge Judy Greer fan, so I was happy in that respect. Yes, yeah, oh yeah, no, she. I was. I didn't really like her character, but I do like her as an actress. I do like her as an uh, actress, but her character is a little kind of, you know. Also, my favorite Halloween movie is three. So, oh I well, hey, three season of the witch, season of the witch. Um, okay, so my number five is uh, 1979's When a Stranger Calls, and uh, again, pretty you know, classic, pretty staple. A lot of people are going to have it on there. But one of the things that I always say, and you guys will be able to appreciate this too, is is that, especially for the younger folks that tend to watch me, you know, who maybe are like, well, it's kind of boring, and it's back and shit. You know, or, you know, The Exorcist. And, oh, well, I don't see the big deal. You know, and, and, you know, I often, you know, remind people that you have to, although it's difficult to do, and I remind myself to do it when I go back and watch movies like, you know, from the forties or the fifties or the sixties, um, is you, you have to watch it within its context, within its frame of when it came out. And of course you don't have to do that, but it helps you to appreciate the movie more. And the exorcist is one that, I mean, if the exorcist were released today, it would be full, which apparently they're gonna, but anyway, uh, it would be a CGI mess and it would be, you know, we know how it would end up. But in 1973, I mean, nobody had seen anything like it, you know, and, and so it was a, and people were afraid. We were more naive back then, you know, people were fainting and, oh my God, it's blasphemous. And this today, I mean, Christians go see. If the Bride of, of Chucky came out in 1973, <laughs> right. people would think it was the scariest movie of all time. Right, right. Exa- that's a very good point, Paul. Right, exactly. So context is really important. And no, the opening to When a Stranger Calls, and I don't particularly think the rest of the movie is that good. I think that the opening is very good and I do like the ending when she's older now and she has children of her own and the man escapes and he's out and she gets that phone call at the at the uh, at the restaurant you know how do you check the children and it's like oh my god you know it's been however many years since she's heard that she instantly knows what that means and what it's all about I think the beginning and the opening are very effective um, but I think the middle of that movie is sort of it's not horrible, obviously, but it's not as strong as the opening. And watching that, and I, and of course, I was born in 1979, so, but I have older siblings, and, you know, babysitting was a big deal back then. I mean, it still is, but, I mean, it, it was a, it, you know, it was a huge deal. It was a way a lot of mostly female teenagers uh, made summer money. And, and you know, to have somebody, you know, to, to watch that film and and keeping all that in mind, watching it, you know, within that context and getting those phone calls and of course playing on the, you know, the idea, the, the, uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, urban legend, if you will, of, you know, the man and the babysitter upstairs, which of course Black Christmas did from a certain point of view, it wasn't, uh, babysitting, but it's frightening. And, and to know that, I mean, he's not just fucking around. I mean, the children are dead. You know, and that's what's so like, there's two dead kids upstairs and there's this girl that doesn't even know it. And this guy's calling from within the house and, and it's very pensive. It's very slow, uh, like a slow burn. It's eerie. Uh, love the tungsten sort of, you know, uh, warm, cozy lit atmosphere inside of the living room. Love the camera movement. Uh, it's just a genuinely creepy, eerie opening still to this day. And then of course you add the, the idea of what is actually going on, uh, unbeknownst to her, uh, is just frightening as all hell, you know? And it's just, and it's not like 
it's a contrast to Billy. I mean, Billy in Black Christmas is all, and all that is creepy as fuck too from a certain point of view. But this is just some guy, you know, have you checked the children? You know, I was like, what? What's it? Uh, it's like, what? what's going on? I guess the wrong number. It's a, it's a newscaster. Yeah, exactly. 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 So from a, <laughs> Have you checked the children? Right. That's right. <laughs> Have you checked the little children? So, I mean, it's, it's sort of like this kind of, you know, it, from a certain point of view, it seems a little innocuous, sort of just kind of uh, underwhelming. Uh, but from another point of view, that's what makes it so frightening, you know, mm -hmm. and, and um, I've always really enjoyed that opening. I wish I enjoyed the middle of the movie as much as I enjoy the opening and the ending. I, I don't hate it, but I do feel that we're like, we, we, we start so strong and then we settle into this detective story and, you know, okay, you know, um, and then we sort of come up again at the end. And, um, but yeah. It's essentially, it's a short film that right. really didn't need to be stretched out, Correct. which I know about very well. Yes, and it's funny you <laughs> mention that because in 2011, I made this little low-budget horror movie that's on my channel. Uh, we shot it on, I think the Canon, is it AV? It was mini DV, but it was full HD. And we had a blast doing it like 10 years ago. And it was called The Intruder. And it's on my channel. And you know what? All things considered, it holds up not too bad. It still looks pretty good, you know, all things considered. And um, and that was based on the first 20 minutes of when a stranger calls. It is basically mm -hmm. that 20 minutes. You know what I mean? And uh, it's, so it's, you're a, right. it's a legendary urban myth. That, it is. You know, yeah, for has sure. It's been adapted so many, so many times. That's but, right. You know, like you said, when a stranger calls, just kind of got it right. And again, in the context of the time, because as you said, that's how kids were making extra money. That's it. That's it. So, I mean, it would fright, and I have no doubt. And again, we have to remember the decade for which it was. I mean, we were a far more naive society. We, we were not as, I mean, we don't have the access to information like we do today at our fingertips. I mean, it was the six o'clock news and the 11 o'clock news and the newspaper the next morning, and that's it. You know, we weren't walking around with computers in our pockets. And, you know, I always tell my audience, that's what, you know, these are, they're not phones. They're computers, they're pocket computers that happen to make phone calls if you choose to do so from time to time. But nobody talks on the phone of these. We're always doing this and texting and mm -hmm. whatever. And, you know, we have the, the information that is just, we're inundated with it. And back then, it wasn't like that. And, and to see a movie like The Exorcist or even Halloween or Black Christmas or, you know, pick your, you know, film. I mean, it was, it genuinely frightened people to the core because it was so like, oh my God, I mean, Psycho, you know, I say this too, Psycho was the first, I believe, North American movie. It might have been the first movie, but at the very least, the first North American movie that um, uh, where we saw a toilet flush. I mean, that's where we were as a society, you know. So now imagine seeing the rest of that movie in its context, and how frightening that would have been for an audience. You know, it's uh, un, uh, we, we can't even really imagine it, you know, to put it in the context because we're so Also imagine now. the conundrum the critics had at that time. Not only was it the first movie to show a flushing toilet, but also a woman in a bra. What do you focus Correct. on? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Where, that, you're bang on. Where's your outrage going to go? Exactly. Exactly. You know, and now we, we, we just don't get that anymore. You know, we, we don't have that. I mean, now it, it, it's got to get almost so gratuitous or or so insanely vulgar, or violent to even achieve what Psycho had an effect on the audience in 1960. You know, so yeah, it needs to um, push the button of the day. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, for me, it's the opening of 1979's When a Stranger Calls. Good pick. Very good pick. Uh, Paul, you're number four. OK. Number four, I'm going to get yelled at for this one. Um, only five, because I no. <laughs> thought, no, only because I, I assume that someone may pick the original. So it's kind of funny if I'm doing this first. Okay. Uh, Scream, Scream 2 mm. is my number four. Mm. Um, mostly because uh, everything about the scene just takes the opening sequence of Scream and turns it on its head. You know, you've got, because in the, in the original movie, it's in an isolated uh, environment whereas in screen two it's a crowded public place right. you know and you take the the whole concept as a killer can be anywhere you know from hiding somewhere to 300 people in an auditorium all wearing the same goddamn mask right you know it's hiding in plain sight you know? right um 
And, you know, the fact that it took the white blonde damsel in distress and replaced him with two smart, witty African-American characters that are talking about the very idea of black uh, representation in horror movies being piss poor, you know, which is great, you know, so making a point while (laughs) it's it's literally happening. Right. Very self-aware. Yeah. And makes both the characters played by Omar Epps and Jada Pinkett Smith insanely likable from the minute they start talking to each other. Yeah. You know, they're talking about movies and they're talking about things that, you know, you want to talk about with your friends. So, you know, something's going to happen to him and he's already struck a chord that suggests that I'm going to, you're only going to be with these people for like five minutes, but yeah. I'm going to make you care and it's going to fucking hurt. Yeah. You know, it's um, funny, you know, what I remember from, I saw that in the theater, actually. I didn't get a chance to see the first Scream in the theater, but I did see the second one in the theater. And what I remember from that that opening, there's a lot, but the one thing, if you just say, well, as you did, the opening from Scream 2, when en- whenever anybody talks about it, the first image that comes into my mind is when he's in the bathroom stall and he's going like this and he gets the knife. Right. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I, I remember thinking, oh, that would really hurt. <laughs> you know? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> But, yeah. you know, the because I've, I've had this conversation with people before and they say, well, yeah, but, it, you know, it doesn't it doesn't play on. It doesn't pay homage to other horror movies like the opening sequence does. And I was like, I'm sorry, it doesn't. You know, we've already mentioned Black Christmas on the show, yeah. which is a very, you know, it's not subtle. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, the reference there. Yeah. And also you've got Craven having fun with, yeah. you know, the fact that they're all watching, basically watching the opening scene of Scream. Right. On a on a theater screen. And he's essentially doing psycho. He's got the sh- he's got the famous shot of the camera underneath the shower head, and yeah, you know, he's he he's having his fun with the movies that he loves. That's you know? right. Um, and again, you know, the big payoff for the sequence for me is you know later on in the movie where Randy's talking about the rules to the sequel. That opening sequence stuck to those rules to a T. It did. You know. Yeah. It stuck to those rules. It. No, I was going to say it's a good it's a good pick too because it I'm realizing as you're talking it does the same thing that Halloween 2018 did which is the the original Scream probably has the most iconic opening in the history of modern horror so if you're making a part two how do you top that how do you you know even come in the same universe right and I think that they did I, I don't know if it's as, as good as the original Scream because that that sort of is the where the bar is but yeah. it, it was pretty great so that that's another good yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that that was the challenge as well for for both Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson. How do you top the uh, the opening to the original? And you can't. That's no. the simple answer. You can't. Right. I, All it's... you can do is play on what made that sequence work, and then establish the rules as to what a sequel should be. Right. And just combine the two. And I exactly. think that that's exactly what they did. They didn't try to replicate it. They just tr- they just said to the audience, "Look, we're well aware that the opening of Scream is great." Yes, <laughs> right. So, it's it's yeah. almost as if they they the opening to you know, like I often say, you know, on my channel, you know, I say that that Scream is you know a very self aware film. It's got it's not a spoof. I mean, that would be scary movie, which of course was the original title for Scream, um, but it, it's spoof e like there's spoof ish moments like you know Wes Craven as Fred the janitor you know what I mean it can become very kind of like that but it has a very it's it's got a great opening it's it's self-aware but it's almost you're right it's almost like well how do we top that well we make it even more self-aware you know and and that's sort of what happened with Scream 2 is that it becomes even more self-aware now they're watching a movie it's like they're watching a screen movie within a screen movie and they're commenting right. on it. And so it, it's, it's the only thing I think you could do and it was either going to work or it wasn't going to work. And they probably knew that. Cause it's like, well, how do we do it? Well, we make it even more self-aware and it's either going to work or it's not. And it's the risk that we're going to take. Cause either it would be, it either would be too, too self-aware too much for people or people would get it and really like it. And fortunately it, it worked, you know, so that's a great pick. It's, a good it's, all, it's also it's very it just feels very dangerous and unsafe because in this day and age that shit could happen you know i can't yeah. rewatch that sequence and not think of aurora right you know? right yeah 
You know, it's yeah. it's just it's a little close to home. Like I don't think you would get away with doing a sequence like that now. No, there's a lot of things you can't do. I mean, there's so much. Yeah, there's a lot of things. A lot of things. Yeah, that's a good point. Great pick, though, Paul. Great pick. Um, Brett, you're number right. four. So uh, there are some people who would debate whether or not this is a horror film. Some people could say that it's sci-fi or psychological thriller. They would not be wrong. So I'm not here to debate whether or not it's horror. I think that it's close enough. And I'm going to choose uh, from, I believe it came out in the year 2000, M. Night Shyamalan's second film, Unbreakable. Um, mm. I think has, I honestly might choose this as the best opening sequence on my list, you know, if not for the fact that it doesn't um, uh, necessarily scream horror film. But the, but the opening sequence of Unbreakable, it starts off with a family in the 1950s, I believe, and a woman has just given birth and the camera is handheld and you're, the baby is crying and crying and crying and the doctor is brought into the room to see if there's something wrong with the baby. And the mother hands the baby to the doctor and says the baby just won't stop crying. And the doctor holds the child and has this, the actor is fantastic, he has this chilling look on his face. And he goes, did you drop this baby? Yeah. And they're like, no, no. He goes, did anyone drop this baby? And everyone's like, no, 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 we didn't. And the doctor says all of his bones are broken. And then you cut right from there to present day, Bruce Willis on a train, another handheld sequence where it's really intimate and it feels really um, intense. The train crashes, right? He wakes up in a hospital room after the train crash. Yep. Doctors are looking at him. He's kind of freaked out. You know, he's just woken up from, you know, being knocked out unconscious. And the doctors say to him, every single person that was on that train died. And we're looking at you like this because you don't have a scratch on you. You don't have one broken bone. You don't have one cut. Now, that is so Shakespearean, setting up these two people that are polar opposites. And you know they're going to collide. And you know the stakes of the film. And it's also setting up this incredible mystery box. Like, how did these two people come about? How are they connected? So I don't think you could really do a more effective opening sequence for a movie period, whether it's horror, sci-fi, or it just, it's perfect. You know? And that is also my favorite um, M. Night Shyamalan movie mm. um, uh, after the opening sequence. But I just think that the opening, like anyone who's a writer in the chat who wants to like, you know, really study an opening sequence that's so effective that that I just don't think you can top it. Well, and it's it's an interesting perspective, too, because, you know, the chat room has to remember that Brett is a writer. So you are coming at this from a very, um, you know, from that writer perspective. So there's going to be a lot of things that in the chat room, some people might be like, huh, that's what, what? And but if you listen to what Brett is saying and you listen to sort of the perspective he's coming from, you're right. I mean, when you think of that opening and you think of the the nuance that's there and sort of the the um even some of the lay, the 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 foreshadowing like the suggestions like how to play with with those ideas i mean it's it's uh even yeah the even just the idea that there is somebody that is unbreakable you know and 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 i remember watching the trailer for unbreakable back in the day i think i was in my first or second no it would have been my second year of college i think and i remember uh seeing the trailer and i in i i thought the movie was pretty good um but i remember seeing uh just there's a there's a there's a hook you know every trailer has a hook or every treatment has a log line right you know whatever it is right you know you got that that hook and for me the hook in the trailer if your trailers are really good especially when you're doing like mysteries psychological thrillers you know whatever horror the hook for me was just that opening of the trailer, and I haven't seen the trailer in a long time. Maybe it's the opening, maybe it's in the middle, I can't remember. But there's a part of the trailer when the camera's just sort of tracking in on Bruce Willis as he's sitting in the hospital. And the doctor is there, and he's describing like, and he's just calm, and, he's, and I'm paraphrasing what the doctor said, but he's saying something like, you know, you're the only one that survived. Do you have any idea how this is possible do you know what's going and it's just you know and he's sitting there and you can tell he's kind of out of it and the, the camera's just tracking in still like this and i'm and in my mind as like a 21 year old kid i'm i'm sitting there, i'm going wow that's that's like that's creepy that's eerie <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like what that's it's a great hook you know, like great hook. that scene just tracking in and hearing what the doctor is saying just that scene in and of itself now maybe it was the whole trailer i can't remember but i remember thinking that would just be a great teaser That'd be a great teaser. Oh, yeah. Just that, oh, yeah. just that, that, that one. Because it's, it's, it, it hooks me. So whether it's, it's not horror, horror. I mean, it's more of the yeah, less sci-fi. There, there, there's themes that are, I guess, are horrific from a certain point of view. 
But I mean, you know, we'll let it slide. It's it's a great it's a it, it's a great just opening, Brett. Just to piggyback off what you said, the fact that that could have been the trailer, the whole trailer for the movie is the camera pushing and the doctor describing what happened. That's incredible because most horror movies today, you watch the trailer and they're visually stunning, but you have no idea what the hell the movie's about. You know, right. it's just from the editor of jump scared, right. jacking the volume up. I mean, like that is real storytelling. Yes, and I think that. Um, that's something that we don't get enough of today. You know, so much of the horror comes out. It's all about sort of the, uh, the, I the miss, I miss original content trailers where they would just yeah. shoot something specifically for the marketing. I really miss that. Yeah. 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 That's what we did for our Indiegogo for it's me, Billy. We, we, uh, we got together and we shot uh, something that was specific for the Indiegogo campaign. Cause obviously when you're, you know, you don't, you know, you, you haven't shot the movie yet. So, um, but it, we, we wanted to set a tone, you know, and we wanted to set, Hey, imagine this, but you know, shot on the red Epic or shot on this or, you know, whatever it is. Right. And we went all out. I mean, you know, we went all out. We, um, and it looks great. You know, it looks total pro and and because we wanted to really set that tone and and say hey you know this is serious you know we're not fucking around here <laughs> you know and uh so you're right though i mean i i miss things i miss when teasers were teasers and trailers were mm -hmm. trailers i also you know? i want to see jordan peele go full hitchcock and do a 14 minute trailer for whatever his next movie is mm. just him talking to the camera you know doing <laughs> yeah, a doing a tour fun. of the location <laughs> That would be fun. That'd be a lot of fun. That, that's a great pick, Brett. I like it. Um, okay, for me, my number four, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a little, oh, you know what? I realized I, I didn't turn my lights on here before the show. Let's see if I can get my lights on there. Oh, there we go. That's kind of nice. And uh, we'll do this. We'll do that. A little late to the party with my blue atmosphere, but uh, better late than never. Okay. Uh, so for me, my number four, um, a little traditional again, but I... I really like this opening and um, it is, I'm an unabashed fan of the movie. Um, I, I, it's not, it's considered the black sheep of the family, but I, I don't think it's a great movie, but I, I enjoy the movie for a variety of reasons. And that's a nightmare in Elm street too, Freddy's revenge. And I, like this opening, I, again, I know there are some continuity issues with the character. And wait a minute, how does Freddy, they see him? And I, I, I understand that. Um, but the opening of Elm Street 2 is like a Salvador Dali painting. I mean, when, when you get to the bus and the road is crumbling away and there's just, and it's miniature, it's so beautiful. I, I wish, I wish we could do that today, you know, and, and the camera and you see, I, I think it, well, it's, it's probably a, in combination with the map painting maybe, but anyway, beautifully done, beautiful colors. You know, it, I think Elm Street 2 was the first horror movie I ever, or, or, or the first Elm Street movie I ever saw, I believe. I think I saw a two and then went back and saw one. One's my favorite, but uh, Elm Street 2, I think has the scariest Freddy. He's scary in part one too. I mean, it's, you know, it's like this, right? But he's, uh, it's just so frightening. The hook nose and the sunken in eyes and, you know, make Freddy scary again. I think that's, I, I got that, you know, I got to get that on a hat. But anyway, uh, so, but this opening, I mean, just from the score, we open up, it's that long shot of the bus coming around the corner and there's like that haunting, eerie sort of score Robert Englund actually is the bus driver, which is, a, you know, a nice little Easter egg if you pay close attention. And, you know, you got this weird sort of awkward kid. I thought that might have been a little too on the nose. He looked, but then again, it is a dream. And it's sort of, it's his, he, he knows he's awkward. He, you know, there's a lot of subtext to that movie. Um, he looks a little, he looks even nerdier and... He looks nerdier and very more, uh, very outcast in the dream sitting there on the bus by himself than he ever does for the rest of the movie. And I always go, well, I guess it's the dream and it's how he sort of sees himself and the things that he's struggling with, whether that's his sexuality or, you know, what have you. Because obviously there is, it's it's not subtext. I mean, it's it's rampant through it, uh, which I think is great. I think it's an interesting sort of take. Um, but yeah, that opening and, 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 you know, and you know, I love movies that there's nothing particularly creepy happening on screen, but you feel really creeped out. And because you know either something's pending or something's coming or, you know, the cinematography is great. And this is, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a low budget B80s horror movie. You know, I mean, it's not, but it's it's got that, 
it's just the payoff, you know, as Paul, you know, talks about. It's that payoff that when you get and things start to happen and, you know, and you're coming off such a successful. Now, whether you like the rest of the movie or not, well, you know, who knows? But at this point in the game, we don't know that yet. If you're watching this for the first time, Elm Street was a huge success, catapulted Freddy into the stratosphere. You know, Freddy is back. Freddy's revenge. You're watching this opening. I mean, my God. You know, it starts and, off on the bus, right? The kid on the school bus. That's that's, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. And things seem normal. And then obviously he speeds up. He drives off into the field and things start to fall away. And there's right, lightning right, right. and the, the bus is just sitting there. Oh, it's, it's a great image. It's, it's a, a great fantastic image. pick, too, because it taps into something, at least for me, that I was always terrified of in childhood when that the bus driver would take us on some, you know, nightmare ride leading to nowhere. And so I think it kind of... Um, it, it, it really taps into those fears that you've had since since you're being completely out of control at someone else. Even, even as an adult, you have these dreams when you're at someone right. else's mercy. Mm-hmm. And yep. I, I actually think that's an excellent pick. It's probably now that I think of it, the best opening sequence in, an Elm, in the Elm Street series. I think, I think it is. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and Freddy is, and just when all of a sudden, like, you know, there's that transition where we, there's the uh, insert shot of Robert Englund's, of course, now in the glove on the stick, you know, doing this. And you're like, oh, fuck, he's back. And then there's just that shot where he grabs onto the pole that's by the driver's uh, seat there. And he, you know, he stands up and he stands, it's, I, you just, he looks ominous. The, the, the way he's lit and he stands up and you just hear, you know. <laughs> You know, and it's like, what the fuck? He looks great. He's bringing up the claws on the bus. And again, whatever you think of the rest of the movie, you know, you don't, if you're watching this for the first time in the movie theater in 1985, you don't know what, what the rest of the movie is going to be like. And and this opening is is uh, uh, probably the best part of the movie, although him coming out of Jesse's mouth and or, or chest, and that's some great, great effects work. Um but it's such a great opening and there's something very surreal and and dreamlike you know uh, about seeing that bus and it's it is it's like a salvador dali painting it, it's it's so surreal and 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 visually beautiful and frightening at the same time All right. it's also the first elm street movie i mean i'm trying to think of <laughs> six uh that um <laughs> that that really kind of blends the uh the, the dream and the reality, because I think Elm Street one, you know, opens with Tina walking through this, you know, hallway in her nightgown. Right. It's a dream. You know, it's a dream. Yeah. Part three, you see Kristen fall asleep right. to go, you know, to wake up with the house. Part four is Kristen again, the little girls doing the chalk drawing. Right. But number two is just a school bus. That's and then right. it's not the it's the moment until, hey driver, that was my stop. That That's you right. realize, uh oh. Exactly. It's a dream. That's you know? it. That's Which I it. think is great. And you're and dude, with me, you're already you're already preaching to the converted. Elm Street <laughs> 2 is actually my favorite Elm Street movie. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. It's my it's- favorite Elm Street movie. I don't think the execution was what? quite there, but the idea of it, right. I think, is the most original of the of the bunch. Yeah, and I I agree and 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 my favorite is still the first Elm Street. Um but two is uh you know it's a, it's a, I some people have a love hate um relationship with it. I understand I under, I understand why it's most people's <laughs> least favorite. That and probably Freddy's Dead. Um Freddy's Dead would be mine. But I I think that it's uh yeah, there's a like everything you said there's a lot of potential there and and they they, there was a lot of really cool effects a lot of good ideas um and robert englund as freddie was that's what he should be in every elm street movie yeah you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said that it's the scariest freddie is in the entire series and i 100 percent agree with you and i understand that each installment had different effects makeup artists and they wanted to add their own spin but when you go from elm street 2 to Freddy's dead and he's playing games and he looks like he's got bubble gum on mm-hmm. his face and he's like, Ooh, cool graphics, you know? And it's, and it's, and you see him lit up like a Christmas tree and it's brightly lit light. And he's, cra- I'm, it's just like, this is not what should have happened with Freddy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't mind if he's, you know, he quips from time to time or he, he says an ironic line or something, but the way they took him was, I think was, was, was incorrect. Yeah. And, um, and with regard to the makeup as well, five and six looked like Robert England in a prosthetic. Right. Right. 
Right. It no exactly. longer looks like a guy that was burned alive. Exactly. And I, you know, I, the Kevin Yeager makeup in two is still the perfect Freddy for me. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, he was the makeup designer on three and four as well. So I don't get why he got rid of the big cheekbones and the hook. All right. Yeah. He had it. He, he had, had it. it. But, uh, he, he had it nailed. Know. He had it nailed. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so yeah, we're back to Paul. Okay, Paul, you're number three. Okay. Number three. Okay, this is my wild card. Um, and as soon as I, as soon as I say the title, everybody's going to be like, "What the fuck is this guy talking about?" All right. Um, it qualifies because even the creators of the movie um, said that the intention of this film was to make a musical comedy horror movie. Directed by Russ Meyer, nineteen oh, seventies, okay. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, the movie opens with a goddamn disclaimer. Yes, it does. <laughs> I haven't seen you know, it in a long know. time, but I, I, I haven't seen it in a long time. But I, I, I yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, if a movie feels the need to explain itself in the first shot. You know that you're in for something wonderfully batshit. That's true. You know, um, and the fact that you've got you know this very horror esque Wagner, you know, uh, bridal chorus playing, right. you know, with the the titles that are coming up. I mean, I've got the disclaim- disclaimer at the beginning of the movie says the film you're about to see is not a sequel to Valley of the Dolls. It is a wholly original, bears no res- relationship to real persons, living or dead. Right. It does, like Valley of the Dolls, deal with the off-time nightmare world of show business, but in a different time and context. <laughs> so people can't complain. <laughs> well, the reason it was thrown on the beginning of the movie is because the author of the original Valley of the Dolls, Jacqueline Susan, right. did complain. And she filed a lawsuit. And rather that. than Fox actually you know, pay any money to make it go away, they just threw the disclaimer on the beginning of the movie. Right. Um, and the beginning of the movie, it starts with, I mean, after the disclaimer disappears and you're looking at this kind of weird Hollywood Hills castle-esque background, the first thing you see is uh, former Playboy playmate Cynthia Myers, no relation to Russ Meyer, running towards the camera in distress. Yeah. And then the next shot is a guy in full Nazi uniform also running away in distress. <laughs> and then a quick cut to... It's like a a long shot of a guy in a very theatrical purple costume with a red cape and a crown wielding a sword. So immediately, like, what the fuck is this? Right. (laughs) But I want to watch it. (laughs) And (laughs) from there, it cuts to Cynthia Meyer looking out the window. She's watching the guy in the German outfit running away and then watches him get drawn through with a sword by the guy in the cape. Yeah. Um, and then she hides, and then the guy in the cape runs up these winding stairs, comes into the house, and you see beautiful Erica Gavin laying on a bed of sleep. And the guy's got a sword in his hand, so immediately you're thinking, okay, well, she's going to get run through She's going to get it. No, yeah. no, no, no. He opens the drawer and pulls out a gun. And then he climbs onto the bed. Yep. And very... I don't want to say seductively, it's the wrong word, but very gently starts to insert the gun into her mouth. It's a very famous shot. The profile of that shot was actually used on the poster. So Erica Gavin's got the gun in her mouth and she starts to stir and she starts to wake. And as soon as she opens her eyes, she lets out a scream with this gun in her mouth, which then has one of the greatest jump cuts in the history of cinema to Dolly Reed belting out the opening scream of the song Find It and you cut it and there's the fictitious <laughs> band of the Carry Nations. <laughs> right. It's so good. Yeah. But then what I love about it is that you realize when you get to the end of the movie that you've actually just watched the end of the movie. So the opening right. sequence is the end, of the, the end of the movie. Right. And, you know, I mean, I think again, the reason that they had to put that disclaimer on the beginning is that this movie went into production in December 1969. So what's on the tip of everybody's tongue at that time? The Sharon Tate murders. And it's right. very, very close yes. to, I mean, especially considering the, a lot of the rumor and innuendo that was coming out at the time before the Manson family were charged 
before all the confessions came out you know so it it's played out as like a wild orgy drug party which is the kind of stuff that was being attributed to sharon tate jc bring uh gibby folger and wojtek frykowski but then it turned out to be complete bullshit and it was the manson family um but yeah it's uh, it's a very very odd movie it's you know there's a difference between bad movies that are just bad movies and there's a and there's a reason that some bad movies are in the criterion collection right of course <laughs> yeah yep. and and beyond the valley of the dolls i think is one of those and you know ross meyer was a very unique filmmaker um you know well you know there is no other ross meyer right you know? and right. he was he was an auteur in the true sense of the word I mean, yeah. he photographed his movies he edited them directed them uh, roger ebert wrote this so, uh, I wonder if he was allowed to actually uh, do a review for his own movie. That would have been weird. That would have been weird. Because he, if... he heavily criticized the first movie. Yeah. Well... Um, yeah, no, that, that was out in left field. Uh, I haven't seen, uh, that movie in a long time. I do remember watching it. it might have even been in college actually. Where did I see but it's it? interesting because it's not a horror film until the end of the movie. Right. Yeah. There's, there are no, there are no horror elements until the end of the movie. Right. And it just so happens that the end of the movie is also is, the opening scene. Is the beginning of the movie. So I, I, I right. like how you spun that. I, I like it. I like I like your way of thinking. Like, hang on a sec here. Technically, this is still the opening of the movie. There you go. I like that. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, Brett, your number okay. three. Number three. I am the king of disclaimers because I have another disclaimer. I I initially when I did my list, I had Scream at number three, but I knew we were going to end up discussing Scream either directly or indirectly. Yeah. So I pushed myself, I, you know, I thought, let, let's come up with something more original, maybe something that the, the chat hasn't seen and we could send them off and to see something new. So I've heard you uh, discuss Breakdown, your love of the movie Breakdown on your show before. And this movie is sort of a companion piece to Breakdown. It would make a great double feature. It's a 1993 Kiefer Sutherland movie. It was a remake, I believe, of a Dutch film. I but think it was I know what you're talking the, about. Remade in the States in 93 called The Vanishing. Yeah, it's a great movie. And the, oh, you know, the yeah, you know, you know, okay. So again, like in terms of like, is it a great movie? Um, that's debatable, but the, the opening sequence when Kiefer Sutherland is driving with, I believe it's Sandra Bullock it in is. one of her first movie roles and they're in the car together. It's a, just a very relatable scene. They get into a fight and we've all been there. You're in the car, you're fighting with someone. And um, so there's already a little bit of a hint that there's some conflict in their relationship. And then they stop at this little, I just love how like iconically American is one of these like road stop um, gas stations, I guess. And she goes in and he's waiting for her and he's expecting her to be back in five minutes. And then it's 10 minutes. Again, we've all been there, right? You're waiting for yeah. someone It's taking a little longer and you're starting to get a little bit nervous what's going on. He goes in, he can't find her. And it's very simple, but it's just so effective because the whole rest of the movie is about this man's obsession with the question of what happened to, uh, is it his wife or is it his girlfriend? I think it's I, his I don't girlfriend, know. I think. Girlfriend, yeah. The whole movie is this guy's obsession with needing to know what happened to her. And it's just, it's incredibly, incredibly relatable. And it's a great dramatic question because if that happened to anyone, it would be something that haunts you for the rest of your life. And it just, it was yeah. very effectively staged. It was very well shot. And um, I think it's worth everyone watching the entire film, but the opening is just, um, it's out of this world. Yeah, and and um, and it doesn't end well either, which is no, which is, but I I always liked that, you know, because that would that's reality, you know. I mean, it, it I I like that it doesn't end with a with a happy reunion, you know, and and that it it's you know, yeah. I I actually don't mind that movie. I I I no, good film. Yeah. It is. It'd be a great double feature with that and breakdown. I'm telling you, tell Tony. Shout out to Tony. Okay, yeah, Tony Michael, if he's watching, uh, double feature, uh, the vanishing and break. Yeah, yeah, because they both. I love breakdown. My God, that's, that's great. A, oh, it's a great movie. So underrated if you haven't seen it. Breakdown, Kurt Russell, um, and J T. Walsh. I think is the is the cop yeah. or the the um, truck, truck driver. Truck. And yeah. he died like a year or two after that movie was made. He's been dead a while, but he was one of those character actors that you saw a lot in the, in uh, well, just in 
in movies. Um, that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, okay, so my number three um, is... <sighs> okay, so... Um, yeah, how do I explain this? So, because again, it's like I don't want to go... I was trying not to go so mainstream, but then I'm like, well... You know, I'm thinking of movies and what is an opening scene that I really, really like and or that really has like an effect on me. And for me, actually, when you said earlier, uh, I, maybe I misheard you, but Paul, you said, um, uh, did we have anything on our list from before 1950, right? Is is that what you said? Or did you say I said 1960. Ah, yeah. I thought you said 1950. Okay, my apologies. And, and then you started to talk about, of course, uh, your first film, uh, Them, which is from 1954. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute. Did he, I thought he said before 1950. Because I actually do have something on my list that is also from 1954. And okay. it is Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. And Beautiful. I uh, I love this opening. Uh, shot on uh, probably the back lot at Universal, I think, and uh, just the 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 camera movement and setting the stage and seeing everybody. We're we're we are, you know, we're we're you know peeping toms. I mean that that's what we are essentially. Just getting this insight into people doing mundane things, cooking, packing, cleaning. I think there's that lady out on the front lawn or something that's doing some sort of like aerobics or something or something. I haven't watched it in uh um a couple of years, but but I love the movement of the camera and setting the stage. And, you know, because you know the movie you're going to watch, you know the kind of movie it is, but you don't know you know, who's who's going to play a big part and who's not going to play, a, you know, a big part. So when I first watched this movie, God, you know, I don't know, uh, 25 years ago, I was probably 15. Is that right? I'm 41. So 10, 20, 20, yeah, almost that. Yeah, 16, 17, whatever it was when I first watched it. I remember, and I knew what it was about and I remember it had an impact. I, and even then, 16, 1995, I mean, even then it looked older, you know, and, and I kind of looked like a set, you know, but I loved it. And and I love just this idea of being able to look out your window and see these people doing all these different things and and um, uh, and who's going to play a pivotal role, who's not, you know, what 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 characters mean something. Does that mean something? Does that not? And the way it's just the way the camera's moving. And of course we eventually get to Jimmy Stewart, you know, and, and, uh, and, and him and how he's uh, held up in his, in his apartment and he's sitting there and he's, it's just great. It's just such a, it's a great movie period from yes. start to finish from start to finish. It's fantastic. And Raymond Burr, of course, uh, you know, rest in peace, Raymond Burr, great Canadian guy. Um, and, uh, and of course just that, that moment at the end when he's hearing him coming to, you know, getting closer and getting closer. My girlfriend was like, this is fucking great. And I'm like, this is great. You know, cause I showed her for the first time about three or four years ago and she loved it. And, uh, um, actually each year for our birthdays, cause our birthdays are very, close to one another. So we tend to celebrate together. And uh, every year uh, we pick a couple of black and white movies to watch together. Uh, maybe a couple of films that we haven't seen yet. Uh, so this was a movie that, that we watched. Of course, it's in color, I believe. But nonetheless, uh, great film. And, and uh, that opening just, you know, I, I mean, there's nothing particularly scary about the opening. It's not like coming from A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, but it's just, it's the, it's the power of suggestion of what could be, you know, and, and who these people are. And, you know, because we don't, it's like, I always love the, the idea of, you know, the, the, the exceptionally horrific happening in what otherwise is a mundane town or a scenario. That's frightening, you know, and you find out, like, you know, you see all the time on the news, well, Bob, I mean, Bob was a nice guy. I was I was just talking to him the other day. He was just cutting his lawn. And I was like, hey, Bob, what's going on? And all of a sudden he murders his whole fucking family. I don't know what's, I love that. I don't love it, obviously, but I mean, in terms from a story perspective, um, there's something very, you know, horrific about that and frightening. And and it's the it's the not knowing of of. I mean, that's just so, and seeing all these people going about their business in their day, I'm just like, somebody here is a fucking murderer. You know, somebody here is awful, you know, and it's like, who is it? 
you know, and it's just, and, and he, he, and, and he, and he wasn't looking out his window with the intention of finding a murderer or whatever. He's held up in his, in his fucking apartment and he's, he's in a wheelchair and he's, he's, I think he's a photographer, if I'm not mistaken, right? Who works for the, the, Mm -hmm. the paper, whatever. And he's got his camera and that's how he's, you know, he's got a zoom lens and he's able to see people and he's bored. He's fucking bored. I gotta be honest. If I had that view, I'd be, I'd be doing the same thing. I'd be bored. And I'd just be like, oh, there's Mrs. So-and-so. What's she doing? Gardening, okay, whatever. And he ju- by chance he happens to see something very strange. Now this this premise, of course, has been you know repeated in films. Obviously, Disturbia with Shia LaBeouf it was a more modern sort of take on on Rear Window. And I even think Christopher Reeves did a a TV film, if I'm not mistaken, in '97 or '8. Obviously, mm-hmm. him actually being in the wheelchair, um, and he played that role. But that but Alfred Hitchcock's 1954 Rear Window. Uh, just just the the potentiality of what's to come when I first watched that movie uh, and seeing all these different people and the camera movement and the way we're moving and we settle in on Jimmy Stewart, you know, and, and uh, it's just, it's great. It's, it's not overly creepy. It's just the, it's the idea of, wow, like, yeah, the, everybody looks so normal, but you think you know somebody and you really don't, <laughs> you know? So that for me is uh, my number three. Good pick. Uh, Paul, number two for We're getting you. Number two, okay. The uh, good ones here. Yes. Okay, number two. Um, I told Brett that I was doing this one yesterday and he lost his shit. So that's why I wore this t-shirt. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> that's all right. This might be the best one on the entire list, I'll say. It's really good. Twilight Zone the movie. Twilight oh, Zone the movie. Um, yeah. Mostly because, I mean, I can't, I can't hear... Midnight Special by Creedence Clearwater Revival without seeing the Soul Bass Warner Brothers logo coming towards oh, it. Yes. <laughs> you know. And yeah. you know, I mean I didn't even think aside, of that. You know, Sorry, the, I, I, I didn't even yeah, think of that. My God, that's such a good thing. It's just emblazoned. Yeah. It's just emblazoned, you know. Yeah. Um the original so obviously the opening is Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks. In a car, just two buddies on a road trip, shooting the shit. Yeah. Um, and it actually, what lent itself to the Twilight Zone is that it was actually a short film idea that Landis had had for a very direct, John Landis, had had for a very, very long time, called Really Scary. Mm. You know, and it's just the perfect way to... Uh, to start a Twilight Zone movie. And I know that they talked about toying with it, like all of the victims of the various episodes would kind of crash at an intersection at the end or something like that. And it was, they tried to tie it all in, but obviously they ended up just using Dan Aykroyd at the end as the ambulance driver right. and using CCR again. Um, but yeah, I mean, I saw that movie on video. I had a, I had an uncle who I think was, he was only a few years older than me. He was like five or six years older than me. Uh, and he showed it, he rented it and showed it to me. And I knew Dan Aykroyd from Ghostbusters, right. you know, but, you know, thinking back at the time, um, this wasn't that far off of, so this, it was shot in 82, came out in 83, Dr. Detroit, which was Dan Aykroyd's first movie without, after John Belushi's passing, had just come out in May of 83. Mm. And then Twilight Zone dropped June, June 24th, 83. Right. So audiences and Dr. Detroit bombed, it, you know, it was not yeah. well received. It didn't make any money. Um, so the audience was still kind of warming up to Dan Aykroyd, Sands, John Belushi. He was still Elwood, you know, in, of course. Yeah. Cause people's it was pre Ghostbusters. It was pre Ghostbusters and trading places also didn't come out until December of right. that year, you know? Yeah. And even at that point when Paramount were, um, when it was suggested that Paramount team up, because they were looking for something of Eddie Murphy yeah, yeah, and Landis suggested Aykroyd. And even they had reservations about it because it wasn't Aykroyd and John Belushi. Right. Um, but the fact that you've got, and it's quite a mismatch as well, because Albert Brooks had just directed Modern Romance, which is a great comedy romance movie from 1981. He wrote, directed and starred in it. Uh, prior to that, he directed uh, Real Life with Charles Grodin and was he got a little bit of fame off of uh, the back of some short movies that he did when Saturday Night Live was 
in its initial season, uh, in its initial run, the original cast. Right. So I love the fact that you kind of had a Saturday Night Live reunion of art, you know, a very odd kind of Saturday Night Live reunion of two guys that you wouldn't necessarily put together in the same car. You know, they could have done Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase or, you know, or Gilda Radner and Jane Curtin. You know, it could have been two people that would have probably been more familiar to that scenario, but they chose mm-hmm. Albert Brooks and Dan Aykroyd, both two great writers. Oh, but yeah. looking back at it as an adult, I would totally see those two just driving from one coast to the other. Oh, 100%. <laughs> you know? 100%, yep. And the thing that's so great about that that scene is that you forget very, very quickly that you are watching The Twilight Zone. Right. Until they start talking about it, because we're introduced to these two guys singing along to CCR, Yep. which by that point, you're also singing along because you yes. love the song. Yep. You know, So you're already in the car with them. And then they start playing, when the radio tape breaks, they start playing the uh, guess the uh, TV theme tune yep. song. And you're <laughs> playing it with them because you want to, you know, you're guessing along with them. And it just puts you in the car with them, which is wonderful, you know, which is very difficult to do in yeah. two minutes. Well, it's you know? so great because, again, you you set it up, you know, you set it up as a situation that there it that there's a it's there's this overwhelming sense of normalcy you know yeah. and and just it's relatable do, right exactly and they're having fun and they and they milk that they linger on that for a bit it doesn't just mm-hmm. open and there's you know 30 seconds of it i mean there's 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 quite a bit of time with them they use it as an opportunity for you to to uh, relate to the relatable characters so you can care mm-hmm. about them um, and uh, and obviously use it as a as an opportunity to set uh, you know that this is just everything's normal you know there's nothing right. there's nothing to see here and then you're right you forget almost not literally but you know you you know you do you're like oh yeah this is a twi- this is twilight zone and then obviously you know yeah shit but starts there's, the there's a wonderful misdirect because the right. minute Dan Aykroyd mentions, did you, you know, did you ever watch the Twilight Zone? That's the moment when you're like, oh, oh, here it comes, here That's it comes. Right. And then they just start arguing about episodes again. And right. you're, but you know, and it completely takes you off topic once uh-huh. again, you know, and then it, you know, as soon as he says, do you want to see something really scary? By this point, you're like, okay, well, I don't trust you now. You're just going to, you're just going to pull, you know, pull the other one. Again. <laughs> exactly. And then they pull over and he just turns around in that wonderful Craig Ridd and makeup with the, you know, big cat growls and oh, uh, yeah. it's Dan great. Aykroyd killing Albert Brooks at the beginning of a movie. I know. It's so great. And the way he says it too, I, it, it's something like, you want to see something really scary or, or something like it's, that. It's the way it's say- this moment. It's this moment. Yeah. It's total Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the moment. Yeah, exactly. And and he and he's so young, you know, and it's just like it's such a Dan Aykroyd, you know, it's so Dan Aykroyd. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and uh oh, it's great. What a great pick. Oh, I didn't even think of that. I didn't even think of that. That's a great pick. My god. Um all right, Brett, you're number 2. Okay, so this is the the it might be the only one that's been mentioned so far, which is a credit sequence, uh, but I'm counting it as an opening uh, scene. I would also argue that this uh, credit sequence slash opening scene changed the way all movies are made because it was so revolutionary, which is uh, David Fincher's Seven, the uh, opening credit sequence where you have mm. Kevin Spacey with his fingertips cut off, writing in his journal, the song Closer by Nine Inch Nails is playing mm. visually. Like it's, it's imagine being like a boxer in the eighties, you know, and you walk into a room and Mike Tyson is hitting a heavy bag and you're like, I quit, right? right I right. think the opening sequence of Seven is so visually stunning, so creepy, so cool, so relentlessly cool, that if you're a filmmaker who ha- who's making a movie or a writer or anyone who's in this industry, and you walked into a movie theater and you saw that for the first time, it's almost enough to make you quit because you know that you're never going to be the best. You're always going to have to be a bridesmaid because it's, it's one of those things that's so good that it's a mic drop. You know what I, you know what I mean? Like imagine working on a film and then yeah, your friend yeah. is like, well, here's my opener, you know, because that, that opener is so scary. And yet it's like, uh, it's almost sexy because right. it's so just visually cool. And, and, um, 
And that changed the way movies are made because now the opening credit sequence is an opportunity for exposition, for storytelling. And Fincher, I believe, Paul can speak to this. I think he came from a music video uh, background yeah. before he got into features. Yeah, and he, he was he was doing Michael Jackson videos, Madonna. He, yeah, he was very and, prolific. And, and then, can, of course, Alien 3 was his first. Yeah, movie. yeah. And you can just see that experience and he pulls you right in like and immediately... Um, you know, when that music starts playing and, and you're and it just it's it's unbelievably cool. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I always aspire to write something that's good enough that when someone reads it, they're like, I don't want to write anymore. You know, I want to give up. And I think that he like achieves that. It's like it's so good that it's enough to make people um, quit. Right. You know, <laughs> just to be like, he's the best. No, that's it. And I think seven, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't the end credits of seven scroll downwards? I don't. Do they scroll downwards? The remember. end credits of seven? Is it seven or Fight Club? I can't remember. Is that seven? Chat room. Uh, do the end credits of seven scroll downwards? What movie am I thinking of? Maybe it happens in Fight Club too. I thought the credits in seven went downwards as opposed to up. Um, and if that is true, I wonder what movie. Yes, they do. Darren Sand says, yes, they okay. do. I remember that was the first time I had ever seen that. And I remember thinking, oh, that that's cool. You know, like you're like they're they're going down instead of up. And and again, the the whole the whole film, like to to Brett's point, I mean, the whole film is aesthetically um inc- and the cinematography is just tremendous. I mean, you really mm. feel the the chat room will love this, of course, the mood and atmosphere that I love so much. You really do feel it in that movie. What a ter- and the and to Brett's point, I mean, the opening is yeah, it is a really good opening. It definitely sets that tone. Definitely sets that tone. That's a good one, Brett. Yeah, I never would have... Uh, seven. Yeah, I yeah, I don't know if I would have thought of that one either. But it's it's good. It's so good. Um, okay, my number two is... Uh, again, I, I, you know, again, my list is sort of traditional, I guess. But uh, my number two is uh, the original Halloween, uh, 1978. And of course, that's classic. I almost feel bad even mentioning it. It's like, I, you know, I almost feel like it's like just, you know, you know, I mean, it's just, it seems so like really, you know, like really, I think I hit the wrong one. Did I? Oh, I hit both of them at the same time. That's why uh, I almost feel like it's a little sort of, you know, it's just like predictable, I guess. Uh, well, I guess these last two are a little predictable, but Nonetheless, the validity is, I think, is still strong, and I'll make the argument, uh, though I probably don't have to. Uh, yeah, the original Halloween, 1978. And again, I think what's so important, and it still holds up today. I mean, obviously, you know, the movie is dated. I mean, it, it is, you know, it is. it was a, it, it was a low-budget movie then. So, I mean, um, it's a little dated today, but it's still, I think it still holds up for all of the important qualities and all the reasons that made it so good then I think still hold up today uh that theater of the mind and the psychological aspect of the of the film and the the opening and and again I can only imagine what it must have been like watching it in context in the theater in 1978 with the music and everything you know we don't know how old Michael Myers is and now we assume that when the POV shot, which which was one of its first of its kind, not the first, of course, but one of the first films to use, you know, the Panaglide and, and sort of use that. Um, and right from the opening and, you know, seeing Judith and her boyfriend and I think Michael's around someplace, <laughs> take that thing off, whatever. And we're following this. And then as soon as the light goes out, that one note, Carpenter, it's just that thing plays and we're following. But we don't know how old he is. You know, he turns out to be a six-year-old boy, but I mean, he could be, you know, he, he he could have been 12. I mean, we don't know. I mean, that's pretty marginal, I guess, in the big picture. But I mean, the moment that that mask comes off and everything, I mean, the, the, the camera through the house, up the stairs, you know, the mask and the optical effect over the, you know, lens. Obviously, they didn't really actually put a mask over the lens. Um, and, uh, but just that whole thing and him coming down the stairs and, but it's the, what, what solidifies it. And again, it's, it's dated. I mean, it's an old film now, but what solidifies it is when the parents come home and the father is Michael and he takes off the, you know, the mask and it's revealed that it's a 
boy. And it's not just a boy, it's a little boy. And he's standing there and the butcher knife is like the size of his torso, you know, and he's just got this bewildered look on his face and the camera's tracking back. And of course, you know, for years, people were like, I don't get why the parents are just standing there. Why are they just standing there? And the, I don't, you know, the, I don't get it. And, you know, I said, I mean, I, I knew instantly, I mean, maybe not when I first saw it, but um, it's it's a cinematic tableau. I mean, that's what it is. And and when I spoke to Dean Cundy at the 40th anniversary convention, one of the things I wanted to, to ask him was, is this true? That was the intention. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, imagine when the mask comes off, you hear a camera go, you know what I mean? And it's just sort of this this moment in time. And yes, maybe Carpenter should have told the mom not to move by putting her hands in her pocket. And maybe they should have been a little more still. Um, but nonetheless, that is, that's the creative choice there. And the camera sort of cranes back and upwards and you're just, it's this, it's this tableau. It's this image of this horrific event that has just happened. You have this little cute little wartime home. You have this mom and dad that are well-dressed, maybe coming back from some little Halloween party, you know, on this quaint little street and it against the backdrop of something horrific that has just happened. And does it, you know, is it tame? Does it pale in comparison to something we'd see today? Well, yeah. But in 1978, that was genuinely frightening, you know, and it's it's such a, a an incredible way to open this movie. And then, of course, you cut to black and the thunder and the lightning, you know, October 30 or October 30th, I believe it says 1978, you know, you're 15 years later. And even just that moment, I mean, that whole opening with Michael is great, but if you want to carry it one step further and you want to go to the moment when we're introduced to Loomis and Marion Chambers in the car and it's it's dark and you don't see anything on the outside, more than likely probably because they maybe weren't actually driving. But nonetheless, I love that. There's this claustrophobic feel you know you don't see what's outside so you get the impression that they're on a on a road with no head uh, with no uh lights it's it's out in the country maybe so there's that isolation that you feel when you don't see you know civilization you know and just the lightning flashing and and he's there and you know we're introduced to this character who who um and my favorite line in in there is uh you know um what do we take him when we or what do we give him when we when we take him in front of the judge or something Thorazine, don't you think, uh, or um, he'll barely be able to sit up or something, you know? And he says, that's the idea. And it's like, fuck, that's the, oh, geez, what, what the hell are we dealing with here? You know what I mean? It's just the whole suspense that is built around this this opening is is terrific. And it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a cliche to put it on a list. It's, we've seen it so many times that I think we sometimes forget the, how brilliant it really was and um and how effective it still is today um so i think that's that's why it's uh that's why it's my number uh, my number 2 my number 2 um very nice anything you guys want to add to that or uh... <laughs> I mean, it's iconic. I, it's, that, that's you know, what I mean, right? Like, what I, can you say that hasn't already been said? Yeah, Halloween is definitely one of my top three favorite horror films of all time, films in general of all time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to argue with uh, with that. That's what I mean. Like, what has what's what hasn't been said about it? You know what I mean? Right. So it's kind of I feel kind of bad even putting it on the list. But <laughs> nonetheless, uh, Paul, your number. One, I guess we're down to your number you, one. You do not have to feel bad about putting Halloween on your list because <laughs> I went with the godfather of horror movies for my number one. Um, and to lead into it, when William Friedkin was hired to direct this movie in 1972, mm-hmm. he was handed a screenplay by William Peter Blatty and said, I have a surprise for you. Here's the script. And the first thing Freakin said was, where's the Iraq sequence? Right. Put it back. <laughs> yep. Because he cut it out. The Iraq sequence in The Exorcist is not only my favorite horror opening sequence of all time, it's my favorite opening sequence of any movie of all time. Because it does something that I've never seen done in another movie, which is very clever. It's very subtle. Um, but is the very reason that Friedkin pleaded with Blatty to put it back in the screenplay. And 
yes, on the surface, it introduces the audience to Father Merrin. But if you think about it, we don't know that it's Father Merrin. Right. He is never mentioned by name. He's only ever referred to as Father in that sequence. Could be the guy's dad, you know. That's yeah, true. <laughs> For a week. No. Yep. I mean, obviously not, but just <laughs> plain devil advocate. Um, and what that sequence does, I mean, again, another opening sequence that is um, that begins with the the famous red Sol Bass Warner Brothers logo, which I hate that they removed for the Blu-ray. It drives me nuts. Um, and it's a dawning sun, a bright, blazing, dawning sun, you know, with a very loud recital of, you know, the Muslim Adhan, the, yes. the call to God. It's beautiful you know? cinematography. That's your movie. That's yeah. that's that's the setup for your movie. Yeah. It is a call to God, yeah. you know. Um, and then we are introduced to this, you know, because by this point, everybody's kind of probably seen the previews or whatever, and they know yeah. that it takes place in a in a house in, you know, the really upmarket area of Georgetown in Washington, D.C. Yeah. We're in Iraq. We're in the sun. This isn't, why is a horror movie this bright? You know, right. what's going on? And I almost feel bad calling it a horror movie because, you, you know, William Peter Blatty was a comedy writer. Right. And William Friedkin was a documentarian. You know, yes, he'd just done The French Connection, but you can't watch that movie and tell me that it was not shot with a documentary eye. Right. Same with The Exorcist. You know, it was, it was, ma- it was made by two guys that, Ne- probably never used the word horror horror while they were making it. Probably not. You know, yep. they they always say supernatural detective story, right? And probably pitched it to Warner Brothers as a drama, or Blatty probably pitched it as a drama right. with horror over times. Because, like you said earlier, if it was made today, it would not be that. It would be made as a horror movie. Well, and I've know? always and that's said, the big difference. Yeah, and I've always said too. Um, if I could just say this, you know one of the big things about The Exorcist, and it's even one of the big things about my number one on the list too, is that, you know, characters, I mean, the, 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 yeah, you know, what's going on with Reagan and the whole, yeah, that's all great. But I mean, the, there's so much richness to the characters and the characters are Mm -hmm. so well developed. And I care so much about what's going on with Damien and what he's, struggling with with his mother and guilt and all this kind of stuff and his loss in faith and god and and like that's all that's all great stuff and it's all it's so well developed and so well nurtured and so well executed that when you know the cool stuff isn't happening on screen i don't care Mm -hmm. I don't care because I'm so invested into the characters. So that's, that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a horror movie, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's ironic in some ways that, um, it's, uh, I don't know if it's ironic, I guess I'll, I'll just say that it's, um, yeah, from a certain point of view, it's a little highbrow, I guess, you know, but Mm -hmm. I like it, you know, for that reason. You know, and it it really is a story about the mystery of faith because it's right. it's one of the few supernatural movies that shows science failing, yeah, and exhausts every possibility. So, what do you have left? The church. Whereas, you know, we get a lot of demonic possession movies now. They're like, she's possessed. Okay, call in a priest. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like there's no love the dichotomy between science and right. faith. Yeah. There's no rationalization whatsoever. Yeah. And that's what The Exorcist does so brilliantly. It gives you that time to yeah. see everything that we conceive as logical fail. Right. So these people are literally driven to witch doctors, you know? Yeah. Um, but again, going, going back to the opening sequence, yeah. which is the whole point, what the opening sequence does so brilliantly in 10 minutes is foreshadow the entire narrative of the movie through very subtle imagery and maybe not so subtle audio. You know, it starts off by introducing the St. Christopher's medal with the Pazuzu amulet, which are two two, uh, relics from two very different times that should not be in the same place. That's true. And the, the curate, the curator of the dig even says that. Right. Um, strange findings, not from the same period. You know? um, and, and that's the idea, you know, because you, in the story, you have this ancient evil that is not something that we are accustomed to. 
you know, even in the Catholic Church, it's kind of referred to as, you know, as an embarrassment. So these two things should not be here. So that's the setup. Yeah. Then you've got, and, for, and Merrin knows that. So you've got him, you know, taking his nitroglycerin pill. So you know that this guy's got a heart condition when he's brought back later. Um, and then you've got, um, when he's in the, the office and the clock stops, uh, one of the theories I read by Mark Kermode, who's like the authority on the exorcist, uh, is that it's the present day stopping so that the right. past can catch up to it. Right. Which I, I think is a, is a really nice little detail. Yeah. Uh, um, and there are sounds throughout that that are used later in the movie. So there are sounds from the Iraq sequence in uh, Reagan's arteriogram sequence. There are, there are oh, sounds yeah. that they, they layered in. Yeah, there's the calling exorcism, back to that. Right? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, the the smelter with the cataract, you know, that's Reagan's yeah. eyes rolling backwards. Yeah. Uh, the woman in the... This is the one I love. The woman in the droshky cart uh, that nearly hits him where he walks out and the cart runs yes. past. And you've yes. got that one shot of the old lady in yeah. the cart looking absolutely terrified. Yeah. I thought this was great. That was a representation of the horror that everybody who witnesses what happens to Reagan goes through because mm. it is out of their control. I like your interpretation. I like that. It is something that you cannot control. And that's one of the scariest things about the exorcist is that you have to, we as the audience can't do anything. Her mother can't do anything. Doctors can't do anything. So Not again, only is it's, it out of your control it's something you don't understand you don't understand exactly right. exactly um and then you've got the uh, the classic moment of the reveal of the pazuzu statue yes which immediately as soon as it starts the dog growls begin yeah. so you know that with this evil comes something inherently violent which right. we see manifest through reagan later on that's right and then the classic high noon standoff yes. between good versus evil that's right and then, and then a setting sun. So you've got your beginning, middle, and end. Right. That what a what a great interpretation of that. And you you laid it out so articulately. And 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 uh, uh, yeah. I mean that I it's it is a great opening. And um, I mean to the point that when Marion is introduced later in the movie, it's in a wide shot. He's walking away from camera with his back to us. Yeah. You just see a young priest yell, "Father." runs up to him, hands him a letter that Merrin doesn't even open. Right. He knows. Yeah. He stands there yeah, and he, he just holds knows. it. Yeah. And he knows. And you immediately know that it's him right. from the opening sequence. Right. You know, right. no words, not even a close up. You don't even see his face. He's just standing there holding this letter, puts it in his pocket carries on walking and you know the the props to uh, I, I don't know who the dp was on the film but i mean owen roisman I, okay well i mean if, if the camera angles and the lenses for which they chose to shoot mm -hmm. that opening with um it tells a story in and of itself and and and, mm -hmm. and helps to sort of solidify and and uh, what you're talking about and and just it it sets a tone and a mood and and people need to understand too that, you know, you can really change the message or what you want your audience to see or feel just in the angles for which you choose to shoot. I mean, you know that. I mean, I mean, it's and and and, you know, you can really it it can it it almost feels like you're tricking the audience into feeling a certain way, but you're not. I mean, you, you want your audience to feel a certain way or see something, you know, uh, even if you shoot at low angle, high angle, eye level, I mean, you, you get different feelings. It's different messages, you know, and, and uh, yeah, the, the cinematography, you know, especially in that opening, I mean, as you were describing it and I was thinking about the opening, I'm like, you know, it's, it's all there and it's, uh, and without that attention to detail, it, it can get lost, you know, on, mm -hmm on the audience. So great points. I mean, really, yeah, the exorcist. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me, I, and I even when I saw it. the film, I saw the film for the first time, I think I was 10 years old and I didn't understand what was going on in that sequence. Right. But I, something about, I knew that it was significant. I just didn't know why. Right. You know, right. and it wasn't until 
because you know it, i don't know if you know the, the lengthy history of the exorcist in the uk but it was banned i do know for a banned. very very long time yeah uh, so it was re-released in theaters halloween 1998 i was 17 years old so i was because i'm six foot nine <laughs> I was able to You're a convince... foot taller than me. I'm 5'8". Jesus. <laughs> I was able to convince the guys at the theatre that I might have been 18 at the time. So I went on a Friday morning on the on the night, uh, the day that it opened, and I had the entire theatre to myself. Oh, that's and amazing. I'd seen it on video countless times but before then, but that was when I felt like I really saw the movie for the first time. Yes. Because... As an adult, it's a completely different film. Yes. Amazing. Uh, how do you feel about, because it's one of the creepiest things in the movie, but it was in the director's cut, not in the theatrical release, the spider walk down the stairs. Do you think that is... You, you hate, hate it, it, do you? What do you, <laughs> yeah. what do you hate too, about it's, it? It's too much too soon. Too much too it's soon. Too much too soon. Okay. Yeah, because prior to that, the, um, the only thing that we have seen is Reagan, when the doctors first come in and she's flip-flopping right the bed right and then she springs up keep away the sow is mine and right. then does her little thing that i'm not going to repeat yeah no, I, um, yes. you know back yeah. back yeah backhands the doctor and all that kind okay. of stuff and then goes crazy again and falls about that's all you see of her manifestation up to that point so to then bring in the spider walk and then go back to the moment where she grabs a psychiatrist by the balls right Feels it's, sort of like a down kind of a step back. Yeah, it's like. Do you wait, think it would have this? translated better had they placed it somewhere else in the film? If there was an opportunity to do that, I just don't think it works in the movie. Mm. I really don't. Okay. I think the the beauty. I mean, I I will only watch the theatrical cut, which is really sad because whenever it's shown in revival theaters now, they only show the director's cut. So right. I haven't seen it on the big screen since. Not well. I saw the director's cut on the big screen. And then right. from there, I was kind of like, no, the theatrical version is, is the perfect cut of this yeah. film. There are things I like in the director's cut, but the spider walk isn't one of them. I don't like That's the it. early doctor's examination, but there is some stuff later that I really like. I always, I, I quite like the spider walk, but uh, because I think it's, it's visually creepy. Um, but I, I concede your, your, your point. I, I, I'll have to watch it again and, and uh, see if I feel the same way about, about its placement. I, I think may, maybe mm -hmm. it's just its placement, you know, and, and, um, and, and maybe like you said, I mean, maybe it's just, you know what, this just it can't, I mean, it was obviously cut for a reason. And yeah. uh, so, but in a vacuum, in a vacuum, you know, seeing that is uh is a little unsettling <laughs> and the scene the scene wasn't even just cut it was abandoned because that right. wasn't how the scene was supposed to play out right. the whole sequence where she actually which is in the documentary on the right. on the dvd where she comes down the stairs and with you know she's got the little tongue that flakes right. out right. and scurries around the the lobby of the house but they, they didn't they didn't cut they didn't shoot any of the other cover like the reaction coverage because they kind of discovered, I, they probably saw the rushes and were like, you know what, let's ditch it, move on. Right, it's not going to work. You know? And I still, I agree that it just doesn't work in the movie. Mm. It's fine. It's great to see it. I was yeah, so, yeah. I was so happy that they found it. Yeah, but I prefer it out of the movie. Out of the movie. Okay, cool. Well, that's a great, that's a great choice, Brett. You're number one. Okay, one thing that Paul said that I want to, I think it contributes yes. to my number one pick. Paul sure. mentioned the the two relics in the Iraq sequence and someone says these don't belong together, that put a, a button in that because that really uh, expresses why this is my number one choice. This is also a classic. I'm not going for an obscure pick here. Okay. We've, we've read it in a book, we've seen it in a mini series and now had it in a, in a film, the opening scene of It, Stephen King's It. Now, uh, everyone, everyone knows the, the opening sequence. The 1990 the, or the, the, uh, or the 2017? The, the 2007 is is does 90 start differently with the boat and the clown and the, and the 90, gutter? 90 starts i think the series has the murder in the in the backyard or something oh i'm going, I'm going with the book right and, okay. and the yeah, book. yeah 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 okay. the clown the clown in the gutter okay right, right. Uh, yeah. um so everyone know like every people who are not fans of horror know this image of the little boy going into the drain and seeing the 
and seeing the clown. So we don't need to debate that it's, we, we know that it's terrifying. Yeah. So the question yeah. is, why is that scary, right? So before, before COVID, when we had museums, um, one of the last exhibits that I saw was this, uh, um, a, uh, an exhibit on collage arts. And there was this one uh, line in a description of, of a piece that really stuck out. It said that when you juxtapose two objects that don't belong together and they share the same environment, you can produce an effect that is uh, horrifying on a very visceral level. Right. And have you ever thought about why the um, the hockey mask in Friday the 13th is scary, right? It's a right. summer camp and the killer is wearing a mask from a winter sport, right? Right. Um, if you're outside doing an outdoor workout, you might see a bug and it doesn't mean anything to you. But in your house, when you see a bug, it's terrifying, right? Right. So the clown does not belong down there. That's right. And it's right. such a striking image that it affected multiple generations, their entire childhood and their psyche, this has gotten into people. And it's something that the reason why I choose this number one is because it's simplicity, it's power, and that it's been so effective for so long. I mean, that book came out in when, in 1980 something? And 86, was, I think. 86, and it was considered the scariest book, the scariest opening sequence. When the movie came out um, a few years ago, the whole marketing campaign was sort of around the little boy in the raincoat. And there's just there's something about him following the paper boat and seeing the clown. And I, I don't know, it's, to me, it's, um, it's horrifying. It's uh, one of these perennial images that you can't get out of your head. And so for a very, very simple reason, I choose it as number one. It's a, it's a great, it's a great choice. Um, and I like that you went there in terms of talking about the layers and, and the subconscious effect that, that, that it can have because of the image, you know, I'm, I'm a huge, I love, you know, uh, films and writers that, that place imagery and certain things, uh, in films and stories that can affect you on a subconscious level, even if you don't, well, you don't realize it because it's affected your subconscious. Um, you know, there's two forms of a universal language, mathematics and symbolism. And, you know, when, when you, when you are a good writer and, and you know your history and you know your, you know, mythology and you know your religion and, and I don't claim to know anything deeper on that side, but and a little bits and pieces, um, it makes you a better writer. And just knowing, having the wherewithal to know that, you know, again, we, we, we don't think of it consciously. Uh, I mean, some might, but we're not really thinking about it, but you're right. I mean, this clown doesn't belong in the sewer. And, and right. therefore, because the clown in and of itself is a, is a very positive thing, generally speaking. You right. know, and, 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 but it doesn't belong there. And it's a very eerie, it's very eerie. And even a lot if the clown was scary, if, if the kid um, was confronted by the clown at an amusement park at a car or a carnival, it's not going to be that effective. It's effective right. because it, it should not be there. And it's almost like um, when you were talking about Nightmare 2, it's something that is right on the line of being a dream and reality. Like, right. Oh, Imagine, right. imagine that happened to you. Even now, as a, as an adult man, you're I walking be, the door and you see a clown. I, and I, I, <laughs> listen, when I go jogging, there are sewer grates the exact same as as the one from it yeah, yeah. along the sidewalk. And every time I'm jogging at night, I'm like, <laughs> you know, they're very not to see any red balloons suddenly pop up. But you're right, and and that is, I like, you know, it does. It affects you in ways. I mean, sometimes people are aware of this, but a lot of people aren't. You know, there's lots of movies like that. You know, that can get into your subconscious and affect you on certain levels that you're not necessarily consciously aware of, but they they affect you in ways, and you feel eerie about them, but you don't necessarily understand why, and and not nor should you. I mean, no, I mean, if you do or if you decide to figure it out great but that's that's the trick of a good writer is is to get in here you know and and uh and affect you in ways that that are effective you know for lack of a better way of saying it and and that's true yeah a clown doesn't belong in the sewer like that and the image of the little boy with the clown in this and it's the space it's this and two the clown is in the sewer and the sewer and basements are uh, can be representative in writing, as you know, of the subconscious. Mm -hmm. And so when you have anything to do with a basement or a sewer or underground, you know, the clown is coming from that space. The clown is coming from that, 
you know, that, that underworld, that, that, that unknown, you know, it's not the clown. The clown is not on the same level, not on the same plane of existence, you know? So the clown, even that is an image of the subconscious, you know, the sewer. Um, And it's really because the clown has something that belongs to the boy that was given to him by his older brother. And anyone who's grown up with an older sibling, like you look at that age, they're your hero. So the fact that the older brother made this paper boat for him, that it it immediately has so much meaning to him. And the fact that this clown has it, there's something so insidious about that entire... Also, it plays into um, uh, what we were discussing earlier when I brought up them. Um, with the you know the little girl being the uh, the victim of trauma in that moment, it's the destruction of innocence. Yeah, right. you know, the, the Georgie doesn't know any better. He right. just it's a clown. You know, it doesn't matter that he's in a you know that he's in a sewer. <laughs> that's right. To him, it's just a clown. You know, that's and right. it's the monster that's preying on that innocence. That's right. Which is you know that's the foundation of horror. Yeah, yeah, bang on. Great, great choice. Uh, well, my number one is uh, a classic. Uh, it, it's a classic film, but it's, it's you know, a classic choice, I guess. But um, for a lot of the same reasons that we've been talking, I do see a, a general commonality in a lot of the sort of uh, picks that, that we have when we walk through our reasoning for them. And uh, my number one is Jaws, 1975. Um, I think, you know, it's classic, it's traditional, um, but it's a good, it's a good tradition. It's a, it's, it's a good piece of cake. And, um, that opening not, I mean, yes, there's the theme as well, but I'm talking about really what I'm talking about is, uh, the opening credit sequence is great, but really I'm talking about when the girl goes swimming and the cinematography in that and seeing her silhouette swimming cast against the moonlight, I guess it's supposed to be. And is just such a striking, iconic image. And when she's treading water, so not when she's actually swimming, but uh, but when she's treading water, and we hear and we hear the the iconic theme, bum 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 bum, you know, and we just see her bum 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. I mean, it's just, and and again, what's so effective about the movie overall, when we were talking about uh, The Exorcist and their characters, I mean, as we know, you know, you know, ironically, uh, the shark was actually supposed to be shown more often and earlier, but as, I mean, everybody knows, of course, Bruce the shark wasn't working, and Spielberg ha- had to rely on, on, uh, on more theater of the mind, which is, it's now become known as, like, the Jaws effect. Uh, some people do it well, some people don't. Um, I thought Gareth Edwards with Godzilla in 2014, um, I, I liked the way he handled Godzilla, but the characters were not interesting. So I think if you're going to it, uh, put, or... In, um, instill the Jaws effect into a story, you better make sure you've got really rich and well-developed and interesting characters because we're going to be spending a lot of time with them. And um, mm-hmm. and Jaws was was great in that. I didn't care when the shark was not on screen because Scheider and Shaw and Dreyfus were, that, that was so, so rich and so great. Uh, and everybody from Murray Hamilton to Lorraine Gary to, I mean, you know, um, but that opening sequence is just, and again, it's it's the location. You are out in the ocean. You are vulnerable. The water, underneath water, basements, sewers, underneath water, again, is another representation of the unknown, the subconscious. And, you know, you are no more vulnerable. I mean, I, I can't think of a more vulnerable place you could be. You know, they often say that, that uh, you are no more... You are no more... How's this go? You are no more closer to death as you're alive than you are when you're asleep. I, th- I think that's something, there's some, I don't know if I have the exact wording right, but of course you're so vulnerable when you're asleep because you're asleep. You're alive, but you're asleep. And you know, you could die in your sleep. Somebody could come and shoot you. Somebody could come and put a gun in your mouth. You know what I'm saying? And all that. And, and so, and I, and I can't think of a, when you're awake, I can't think of a more vulnerable, I'm sure there are, but I can't think of a more vulnerable place to be than in the middle of the ocean with nobody around. And, and you know, at night, not knowing what's beneath you. And, and, and it's, I can only imagine what that was like watching that in 1975. 
you know, and and again, thinking of the context of the of the of the decade we're in, the time, what life was like, you know, um, people never seen anything like this before in this way, this 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 intense, and her screaming and being thrown back and forth, and oh god, oh god, oh god. I mean, it's, I, I mean, can you imagine what that must have been like in 1975 to watch that just play out and not see the shark? Um, it is such. Again, I mean, it's it gives me goosebumps even talking about it, and the imagery is just iconic and classic in and of itself. And and uh, I think for me, it is the vulnerability, it is the isolation, and it is the unknown of you know because she's out there. I mean, she's not like you know miles out there, but she's out there where there's got to be at least you know when the camera's looking up at her. I mean, I'm thinking she's got to be out there. There's got to be ten, twenty feet below her, you know, and the sharks coming by, and and just that, it's scary. Very, very scary, and and a, a little classic, a little traditional, but I don't think you'd find anybody that that would turn and go, no, I don't know what you're talking about. It, it very effective, and even today, uh, like The Exorcist, um, you know, and like I think most everything we've talked about, I think even today those those um, those openings are still effective. You know, some you got to watch within their context, like Halloween, and you know, but I mean still very effective today and and the longevity of that i think is 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 great and of course what 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 hasn't been said that's already been said or what yeah you know i mean yeah what hasn't been said about it you know what i mean so for me it's jaws at number one for me i don't know the no name complaint. Uh, sorry go ahead paul no complaint here dude ah uh, <laughs> i love it <laughs> I love it. That's great. That's awesome. There you go. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's just so iconic. You know, you can, but just those layers that are there, and and the the murkiness of the water, and you know, the moon, and the and that you know how she's backlit, and just knowing that where else can you be that vulnerable and at the mercy of the ocean, uh, or, or right. you know, at the mercy of whatever is there, then then on the ocean. You know, like that. You're not even on a boat. I mean, even the orca was safer than she was. You know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the name of the actress who, who who was in that opening sequence, but that is also potentially the most realistic on-screen death. I mean, that young woman is terrified. Yeah, and that she. Was she was being jerked back and forward by two really big stuntmen. Yes. I mean, I don't <laughs> know what rope, they did but... to her, but it's it's almost like disturbing to what or uncomfortable even to yes. watch because you know, especially now, we're far more conscious of how safety and precautions are taken on on movie sets. And I don't know what was done to get her to that place, but most horror movies you see it, and it's 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 a performance. You can see yeah. that it's a great yeah, physical performance is... because all she had to do is like when she got jerked. You, if you throw your arms in the opposite direction, yeah, that makes it look as though you are being exactly pulled against your will. And her, you know? and it's wonderful. Yeah, and to Brett's everything point, about that performance is wonderful. Right, and to Brett's point, and to both your points, actually. I mean, I mean, her scream, it, it, and again mm -hmm. to the performance. I mean, it gen. I I believe it. I believe she is being attacked. I believe it. You know, and and that is important. Is is I need to believe it. Uh, I don't need to see the shark. I know what a shark looks like. I, I, I you know, because I've seen one up close. No, that's Jaws too. But uh, <laughs> which actually is, you know, yeah. um, but uh, certainly that. I mean, just the every time I watch it, I'm like, I believe this girl. I believe yeah. she's being attacked. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, my cat's coming in. Come on in, Veda. How you doing? You want to get on the show? Yeah, you want to show? Come here. Oh no, you're gonna turn away. Okay, all right. She's she's shy, but she's <laughs> come on, come on, let's go on. Veda, what is your favorite opening of all time? Uh, was that Pet Pet Cemetery? Okay, all right. Well, it's it's Pet Cemetery from Veda, so that's uh, that's what it is. Good there. choice. Good choice. Good choice. Yeah, very good choice. That's right. Um, cool. Now, um, okay, so we've been going for over two hours now. Do you guys have a little bit of time to take a few questions from uh, the, the chat room? How are you for time? Because I don't want to yeah wanna go too much. Okay, longer. I can do uh, yeah another ten minutes, let's yeah. say, or something like that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. So we'll we'll take a few questions from the uh, chat room. Or we'll go another 10 minutes or so because I got to skedaddle too because I've been drinking the water and uh, I feel myself having to pee in a few moments. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So if you have any questions for myself or for Brett or for Paul uh, about their careers, whatever it is, uh, let's get this thing going. Michael Myers says, Dave, Brett, and Paul, what is your favorite moment from John Carpenter's The Thing? I'll let these guys start. 
Go on, Brett. I'm going to have to think about this one. Yeah, I, um, it would take me, it's been a while since I've seen it. So it would take me, uh, I don't know if I would give an answer that's worthy of, uh, of the question. Because the, the one thing that I will say when I think about the thing that's really unique is that there's not enough horror that takes place in the snow. You know, in, in cold environments, right? And so that sort of that sort of stands out, just the the environment of the movie. But I would need to do a rewatch to to give a an answer on that. Okay. If I if I on the spot, um, I think it, again, I think it has a very strong opening. You know, just the uh, it does the, the white blanket of snow with the uh, the dog running towards the camp, being chased by the helicopter. Yes. Uh, but what I do love in a horror movie is a lovely ambiguous ending oh it's so great you know not knowing paul i mean it just you know had nergasms when you said that because because it's it's, <laughs> it's true and i've often said to people they'll say to me you know who do you think's got it and i'll turn to them and i'll be like it doesn't matter because doesn't matter. the thing has already won and the reason why the thing's already won is because neither of them knows and neither of them can trust each other. So the paranoia that they're both going to feel when they're in each other's presence, sleeping, not sleeping, the thing's already... Now, maybe neither of them have it. Maybe neither of them have it. And But they don't know that. But they don't know that. <laughs> and that's why it works. Exactly. And that's why it works. It doesn't matter... You know, th they could both be clean, but they're net, but they don't know that. And they're going to spend the rest of their existence, however long that goes, whatever happens, somebody comes rest. I, I don't know. Maybe they're locked in there for who knows forever. Uh, whatever that yeah. is in it there. It feels very time. real. Yes. For now. <laughs> yes. Ex yes, exactly. So it doesn't matter. It, 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 the thing has already won. The thing has already won. And I think yeah. to piggyback on what you said, I think that's probably my favorite my favorite uh, moment in the movie. I mean, there's a lot of them. Like, I like when the dog senses something and, and of course, you know, the creature's there and it's like, oh my God, you know what I mean? And, I mean, the practical effects are fantastic. Um, yeah. I mean, all... that's, again, if I was to say anything, it it's my number two greatest practical effects movie of all time. Oh, yeah. It's great. But I love the way that ends. And it's like, because some ambiguous endings, you're like, okay, I see what you did there, but you needed just like another couple of minutes. Like you just needed another, it was a little too soon, a little too soon. It's like shots. I mean, you know, you know this, I mean, sometimes, you know, you can shoot something and when you're editing, you know, sometimes you can cut away too early and it needs a few extra frames or a, a few extra yep. seconds. And then sometimes it's too, it's too short or, or, or too long, you know, and you need to cut it down a little bit. And I sometimes feel that way with ambiguous endings. I'm like, okay, I know what you're trying to do. I get it. But oh, I think you need, but the thing is just like, uh, no, that's perfect. exactly where you yeah. need to end it. It's, yeah. It's pitch perfect. Yeah, it is. Uh, a couple super chats came in. Let's see here. Uh, G uh, Jason Case sends in a super chat from earlier. Says, what about Friday the 13th, the remake opening? I'm not a big fan of the movie. I thought it was pretty pedestrian and par for the course. I mean, intense. Can I be honest? Updated, but. Yeah, really I haven't it. seen it since it came out. I didn't. I didn't dislike the movie, mm. um, but I've not seen it in a very, very long time. Okay, Brett, what about you? I thought the opening was the best part of the movie. Yes, agreed. Um, you know, so it's a thumbs up. I think. I think that would have been a perfectly acceptable top five. And uh, oh, there I'm you old. go. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, Frank Riker sends in a super chat. Says Brett and Paul, what do you guys think of the opening credits of Lord of War with Nicolas Cage when the bullet is being made? If you've seen it, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. No. Nope. I haven't seen it. Not seen it. I haven't seen it either. Apologies. Uh, yeah, that's okay. That's all right. Um, Brett, I have a question for you. What was it like being a Wookiee in Solo, a Star Wars story? You mean Paul? Yeah, Brett. What oh, was sorry, it like? Paul. Excuse me. Excuse me, Paul. <laughs> Yeah, 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 Brett. What was it like? Come on, we know you were there, Brett. We know you were there. Come on, <laughs> Paul. Excuse me. Right. It was. Um, it was. It was a lot of fun. It was hard work. Um, the the thing that was most interesting for me, being a filmmaker, was getting to kind of see both sets of directors at work. So I came in when Phil Lord and Chris Miller. We're still we're directing the movie, right? Uh, and I did a lot of stuff in uh, pre-production, 
right. as because the guy who plays Chewbacca, uh, he's a native of Norway. Right. So I was a lot more local to Pinewood Studios to bring in for uh, camera tests and light tests and show and tells for props. And so I got to be chewy in pre-production, That's which amazing. was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, and I saw a lot of stuff that uh, Lord and Miller were doing that didn't end up in the movie. And it was very, very exciting. Um, and this was all while our own, because there were four of us, there were four people, four guys that were cast as, as Wookiees. This is while they were still building our suits and kind of figuring out what we were going to look like. Um, and then our scene, which was the big uh, liberation of the droids and the slaves on the, the, the Kessel mine. Yes. Uh, that was right at the end of the schedule. Mm. And I remember we came in for the big show and tell with the director. You know, we had all our costumes on for the first time. And we almost did like a Macy's Day parade <laughs> <laughs> through, through Pinewood with, with all, in all of our stuff with them watching. Right. And all the Disney execs are there and Kathleen Kennedy and all those guys. Um, and then the next day was when they were let go. Ah. Like you would not have known. Right. That anything was was going to go go down, um, and then I think it was like a two week break, and then Ron Howard came in, and then our scenes were right at the beginning of his schedule because he practically reshot ninety percent of the movie. Yeah. Um, so we came in and we shot for I want to say two or three weeks on the big exterior stage uh, of the exterior of the mine with the Millennium Falcon. Seeing the Millennium Falcon was a trip. I bet. You know? And being and being tall enough to kiss the palm of my hand and tap the cockpit. Yes, <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's that awesome. was the first thing I did. I bet that was the first thing I did. Uh, so we did that, and then that was like two weeks. Um, it was very hot. We were shooting in the middle of a heat wave. Yeah, uh, which is very rare for London. Right. Uh, and then we were brought back towards the end of the schedule. We had to shoot all the stuff inside the mine, which was like filming in an oven. Oh, I bet. And we had a whole fight sequence that was cut. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you really saw Wookiees kick ass wow. in this. And I was I was distraught to see that it was cut. But I'm in there. You see me yeah. for about three seconds. That's cool. That's so, cool though. I, I actually like the movie. You, you, I thought it was a I thought it was a great movie. Yeah. Of the modern of the Disney era Star Wars movie yeah. Disney era Star Wars movies, I think it's among my favorites yeah. in Rogue One. I thought it was fun. I thought it was that. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I, I had. To but you ask can see that. me. There's this one shot where um, I think it's when they when they first come out of the entrance of the exit of the, the the mine. Yeah. There's this wide shot that pulls back of everybody running towards the camera, and I'm the Wookiee on the far left carrying a giant drill. All right. I I have the movie on Blu-ray. I'm there you gonna, go. I, and I have it digitally as well. So this, I'm gonna. I'm gonna that was on day one. The prop guy walked up to us with this giant drill. And it's like, which one of you guys was? And before I could even let him finish, I just grabbed it. And the other guys looked at me and it's like, why do you want to lug that thing around? And I turned to him. I was like, action figure, dude. Yeah, <laughs> I've got the accessory. That's. I, I was but, just going to say that, and you'll be easy to identify in the movie. There you go. Yeah. But there's been no action figure, so more That's for me. Bad. I lugged that thing around for three weeks. <laughs> Well, maybe you could it make. Fun. Yeah, maybe you could make your own. You can get Chewy, put a little drill in it, and like maybe paint him a different shade or something. Or, well, I've I've done some of these uh, conventions, and people come up to me all the time. They're like, "Do you want me to make a custom figure of you?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I haven't seen any, <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm still waiting." You're there's still all, waiting. Like eight guys out there. I got you. I got you. Um, okay, just a couple more here. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, Duke Fleet says, Hey, Brett, Paul, and Dave, what do you think of the opening of Suspiria? I'm assuming he means the original. Um, mm. I haven't seen Suspiria in a long time. I'm trying to think of how it opens. I, yeah, I, I remember seeing it not long, the original not long ago. And um, what sticks out are the, I mean, this is about the movie in general, but what stands out are the, the, the colors of that film. It's used of color. Mm. It sort of yes. has like a hypnotic. Yep. quality to it in the opening scene. There's actually a great quote by uh, the writer Marlon James. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, um, but he, he has a great line where he says that a good horror movie is like a seduction. Mm. And I think that Suspiria has that. There's something that's like a really hypnotic kind of uh, strange quality about it. Yeah, And it's true of the opening. It's true of the whole film. 
Yeah. Like, you can't even define it necessarily. It's just like a spooky mm-hmm. ethereal thing that, that the movie does to you. That's true. I agree with that. I agree with that. What about you, Paul? Yeah. No, same. Agreed. You know, I mean, the the, the thing that, that always stays in my mind with Suspiria is the, uh, the very same reason that Wes Craven gave Freddy the red and green stripes right it's the the overt use of red and green together that's just very unsettling yeah so that's a good point it's my favorite argento movie i guess that's what's unsettling about christmas maybe i don't know but i'm bummed there you go um all right hey listen uh paul and brett i want to thank you guys for joining me uh, on this episode of mccray live when i uh sign off here we'll we'll have a you know, formal sort of goodbye, but, uh, for the show and for everybody in the chat room, uh, thank you. Thank you for joining me on the show. Uh, Brett, really glad we could make this work. Um, yeah, this was a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I'd love to have you guys back on in the near future and, uh, maybe we could think of another sort of, uh, top five list of something, which might be kind of fun because, uh, let's do it. Yeah. Absolutely. This was a lot of fun. And uh, folks, um, I will be, I should be back tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. for episode 97. I may not be though. And if I'm not, of course, I'll I'll let you guys know in the community section on YouTube. Uh, But uh, that is going to do it for episode 96 of McCray Live. I want to thank my moderators, of course, Frank Riker, Tab of the Short, Darren Sands, and Jason Knight for doing what you guys do. I saw some of you guys chatting amongst yourself there about what we were talking about in our top fives and stuff. It's always great to see that. And I think uh, we have 103 people watching at the moment. I think we hit about 134, if I'm not mistaken, at at one point. So that's pretty good. I was uh, I'm pleased with that for this uh, for this episode. So uh, we'll see what uh, the view count is uh, as we roll on. But uh, yeah, great stuff. And um, let me just uh, get the little patron card ready here. There we go. So uh, yeah. All right. Um, any last things you guys want to say, Paul, Brett? Any last things you want to say? I Paul? just you know I'm I'm glad that Brett. Uh, reached out to me to make this happen it was a lot of fun yeah yeah it was super fun i i uh would just like to say that i uh am a big fan of your mccrazies your community i think that uh, (laughs) especially now during covid everyone feels isolated and i think that what you've created this platform for people to to talk about stuff that they in this case horror um it's it's a it's a great thing and i um yeah and i and i think that it's just uh it's a beautiful thing during covid I appreciate Sorry. that. I appreciate that very much. It's 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 grown into something that I didn't expect. You know, I, I just wanted to talk about movies and get on here and express my thoughts. And now it's turned into this. So uh, <laughs> we'll see where it goes. We'll see where it goes. Um, all right, folks. Uh, have a great rest of your day. And in the meantime, in between time, we will talk to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>